Good evening, everyone. I'm Stephen Smith. I'm lead Lord and Reverend for South Church. I'm a chaplain of South Church, a priest of South Church. I'm also a preceptor of Church. I'm a preacher of Church. Well, I have a doctor of being, doctor of reason, doctor of ministry, doctor of physics. On my course, I'm a professor of theology. As we're in the late stages of May and subsequently spring, with the Ukraine war ongoing and continued rampages of hatred and wrong here in the U.S., human nature is and never will be unchanging. However, we Christians can surmount our own nature on the daily. In my last sermon, Theological Dive, we talked about Christian nationalism, dominion theology, and why both are antichrist. With the recent mass shootings in Texas, which robbed the lives of numerous children of whose family I grieve with, as well as the mass shooting domestic terrorist attack in Buffalo, New York, by a person who was taught preached hatred and was indoctrinated by the white replacement theory, that is commonplace in Christian nationalist groups, extremists, of whom the said attacker was dominated by the spirit of hate and the spirit of anger, and gave in and harmed others. Lucifer uses a hate in the hearts to do unspeakable evils, and this is irrevocably proven every single time. And with some Christian pastors who continue to preach the false doctrine of one saved, always saved, especially after the mass shooting, to justify their belief that God allows their hatred to continue sin, and trying to justify their sin beforehand, this week we will focus on, slash do a refresh course on sin, its definition as well as focus on fallenness and why we as Christians have to follow Majesty Day in God's image to the letter and what must be done to combat hatred and wrong. So this will be very lengthy and I do apologize beforehand. So before I begin, let's take a look at this one verse. Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules the spirit, then he who takes the city. That's Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32, in your standard version. I was reminded of a sermon preached by Billy Graham, The Truth is Difficult. In the sermon, Billy Graham spoke of this verse, Proverbs 16, 32, and stated that he who rules his mind is greater than he who takes the city. Which, his meaning is he who rules his thoughts is greater than a conqueror of a city, since our minds are an enmity with God. Billy Graham also stated that until we come to Christ, repent, which means changing of the mind, we are enemies of God. Enmity, which we will be talking about, hatred, and more later on in the sermon theological dive. So what is the theological definition of sin? According to Baker's Evangelical Dictionary of Biblical Theology, sin is defined as Sin is a riddle, a mystery, a reality that eludes definition and comprehension. Perhaps we most often think of sin as wrongdoing or transgression of God's law. Sin includes a failure to do what is right. But sin also offends people. It, it is violence and lovelessness towards other people and ultimately rebellion against God. Further, the Bible teaches that sin involves a condition in which the heart is corrupted and inclined towards evil. The concept of sin is complex and the terminology large and varied so that it may be best we look at the reality of sin in the Petrarch first, then reflect theologically. The History of Sin In the biblical world, sin is, from its first appearance, tragic and mysterious. It is tragic because it represents a fall from the high original status of humankind, creating God's image, Adam and Eve are good but immature, fine but breakable like glass dishes. They are without flaw, yet capable of marring themselves. Satan uses a serpent to tempt Eve and Adam, first to question God, then to rebel against him. First Satan introduces doubts about God's authority and goodness. Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So hath God said. That's Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. He invites Eve to consider how the fruit of the tree of knowledge is good for food and for knowledge. We see the tendency of sin to begin with a subtle appeal to something attractive and good in itself to an act that is somehow plausible and directed towards some good end. Throughout the Bible, almost every sin reaches for things with some intrinsic value such as security, knowledge, peace, pleasure, or a good name. But behind the appeal to something good, Sin ultimately involves a raw confrontation between obedience and rebellion. Will Adam and Eve heed their impression or God's instructions? Will they listen to a creature or the creator? Will they serve God or themselves? Who will judge what is right, God or humans? 
who will see to the results? Ultimately, by taking the position of arbiter between the conflicting counsel of God and the serpent, even Adam have already elevated themselves over God and rebelled against him. Here, too, the first sins disclose the essence of later sins. Sin involves the refusal of humankind to accept its God-given position between the Creator and lower creation. It flows from decisions to reject God's way and to steal, curse, and lie simply because that seems more attractive or reasonable. Here we approach the mystery of sin. Why would the first couple, sinless and without inclination towards sin, choose to rebel? Why would any creature presume to know more or know better than its Creator? Adam and Eve became sinners by a historical act. The principal effect of sin are alienation from God, from others, from oneself, and from creation. They emerge almost at once. Alienation from God led Adam and Eve to fear and flee from him. Alienation from each other and themselves shows in their shame, awareness of nakedness, and blame shifting. Adam acts out of all three alienations at once when, in response to God's questions, he excuses himself by blaming both Eve and God for his sin. The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit. Genesis 3, verse 12. The sentence God pronounces upon sin includes grace, 3.15, and suggests that he retains the sovereign control over his creation, even in its rebellion, but also establishes our alienation from nature and the curse upon childbearing, work, and creation itself. Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. After the curse, God graciously closed the first couple, but he also expels them from the garden. Genesis chapter 3, verses 21 through 24. He graciously permits them to reproduce, but death enters human experience a short time later. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Genesis chapter 4, verse 8. Genesis chapter 5, verses 5 through 31. These, these events prove the vanity and futility of sin. Adam and Eve seek new freedoms of dignity, but sin robs them of what they have. Seeking advantage, they experience great losses. Genesis and Romans teach that Adam and Eve did not sin for themselves alone, but from their privileged position as the first original sinless couple, act as representatives of the human race. Since then, sin, sinfulness, and consequences of sin have marred all. Every child of Adam enters a race marked by sin, condemnation, and death. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 21. These traits become theirs both by heritage and as they grow into accountability by personal choice, as Cain's slaughter of Abel quickly shows. In Cain's sin, we see we have early hint of the virulence and intractability of sin, whereas Satan prompted Adam and Eve to sin. God himself cannot talk Cain out of it. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, and Genesis chapter 4, verse 6. While sin was external to Adam and Eve, it appears to spring up spontaneously from within Cain as a wild force in him, which he ought to master lest it devour him. Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. Sin is also becoming more aggravated. It is premeditated. It begins in the setting of worship and it directly harms his brother who serves love. After his sin, far from manifesting guilt or remorse, Cain confesses nothing, refuses to repent, and chides God for the harshness of his punishments. Genesis chapter 4, verses 5 through 14. Cain's sin and impenitence foreshadow much of the future course of sin, both within and without the Bible. The Biblical Terminology of Sin The vast terminology within its biblical context suggests that sin has three aspects. Disobedience to or breach of law, violation of relationships with people, and rebellion against God, which is the most basic concept. Risking over simplification among the most common Hebrew terms, hatet means a missing of a standard, mark, or goal, pesa, means the breach of relationship or rebellion, awon, means perverseness, Sagak signifies error or mistake. Resa means godlessness, injustice, and wickedness, and amal. When it refers to sin, means mischief or oppression. The most common Greek term is hamartia, a word often personified in the New Testament and signifying offenses against laws, people, or God. Corruptoma is another general term in the offenses or lapses. Edekiah, sorry for all the mispronunciations, by the way, is the most daring legal word describing unrighteousness and unjust deeds. Parabasis signifies trespasses or transgression law. Arcebia means godlessness or 
Pitian and Amnonia means lawlessness. The Bible typically describes sin negatively. It is lawlessness, disobedience, impurity, unbelief, distrust, darkness as opposed to light, a falling away as opposed to standing firm, weakness, not strength. It is unrighteousness, faithlessness. The Biblical Theology of Sin the historical and prophetic books of the Old Testament illustrate the character of sin under these terms. From Judges to Kings, we see that Israel forsook the Lord, who had brought them out of Egypt, and established a covenant with them. They followed and worshipped the gods of the nations around them. Judges chapter 2, verses 10-13. through 13. Sometimes they served balls with singleness of purpose, filling Jerusalem with idols and lawlessness, reign, Ahab, Ahaz, Manasseh. The sin of human sacrifice followed in the reigns of such kings. 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 6. The existence of human sacrifice underscores the depth and gravity of sin. People can become so perverted, so self-deceived, that they perform the most unnatural and heartless crimes, taking them to be worshipped. Isaiah rightly says, they call evil good and good evil. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20. Later the Pharisees, utterly sincere yet hypocritical because self-deceived, would revive the sin by killing not their children, but their maker and calling it an act of service to God. Which, of course, we'll be talking about the Pharisees later. And are pretty much all the long Christians these days, for that matter. Paul's theology of sin principally appears in Romans chapter 1 through 8. God is angry because of sins humans commit against him and one another. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. Unbelief is the root of sin. Failure to glorify or thank God leads to idolatry, foolishness, and degradation. Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 25. Sometimes he permits sin to develop unimpeded until every kind of wickedness fills the human breast. Romans chapter 1, verses 26 through 32. Paul's imaginary reader objects to this indictment in several ways. Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 and 8. Paul replies that while not everyone sins so crudely, everyone violates standards they consider just. Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. If someone professes to belong to the covenant, have knowledge, and so enjoy special standing with God, Paul asks if they live up to the knowledge they have of God's law. Romans chapter 2, verses 17 through 29. Everyone is a sinner, he concludes, and stands silent, guilty, and accountable before God. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 21. Paul's sin lists cover the gamut of transgressions from murder to gossip. Despite his use of the term flesh, sinful nature, in some translations, Relatively few sins on the list are essential, most concern the mind or the tongue. Romans chapter 1 verses 28 through 32, Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 through 21. Like Jesus, Paul affirms that sin is an internal power, not just an act. It enslaves any whom Christ has not liberated and leads to their death. Chapter 5 through 23, so that the unbeliever is incapable of pleasing God. Verses 5 through 8. Sin continues to grip every, even the redeemed. In chapter 7, verses 14 through 25. But principal deliverance from sin comes through the justification by faith in Jesus, so there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The Spirit in his believers empowers them to work out deliverance. In chapter 8, verses 9 through 27. Much of the rest of the New Testament restates themes of the Gospels in Paul. James marks that sin begins with evil desires, James chapter 1, verse 14, James chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, and leads to death when fully grown, James chapter 1, verse 15. This and other biblical remarks suggest that iniquity gains some of its power through repet repetition. Pretty much a rest of once. When an individual commits a sin, it can become, through repetition, a habit, a vice, and a character trait. When one person imitates the sins of another, wickedness can be institutionalized. Whole governments can become corrupt. Whole industries can be based on deception or abuse of others. Societies can wrap themselves in the fabric of deceit. Thus, one sinner encourages another and the wrong kind of friendship with the world makes one an enemy of God. James chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. And of course, we're seeing this happen a lot, especially these days. Although negative and irrational, sin is also a power 
It crouches at Cain's door, ready to devour him. Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. It compels Paul to do the evil he does not wish. Romans chapter 17, 7, verses 14 through 20. It moves and is moved by demonic and societal forces. It enters the heart so that wickedness wells up spontaneously from within. Matthew chapter 15, verses 17 through 19. Its stronghold is that all but instinctive tendency to put one's own interests and desires first. So that's self-centered. That's that narcissism, for example. From the selfish heart comes rebellion, godlessness, cursing, lies, slander, envy, greed, sensuality, and pride. Matthew chapter 12, verses 34 through 37. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. Three factors compound the tragedy of sin. First, it pervades the whole person. No sphere escapes, for the very heart of the sinner is corrupt. Psalm chapter 51, verse 5. Jeremiah 17, 9. Romans 8, 7. Second, evil resides in the heart of the crown of God's creation, the bearer of God's image, the one appointed to rule the world for God. The remarkable capacities of humans to think, plan, persuade, and train others enables wickedness to become clever and strong. Third, sin is proud, hence to resist God in his salvation and offers a counterfeit salvation instead. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 2-4 through four. Despite all its dismal qualities, sin can ma- makes one contribution because God chose to redeem his people from it. Sin has been the stimulus for God's demonstration of his amazing patience, grace, and love. Romans chapter 5, verses 6-8. through eight. Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 through 21. First Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. So the study of sin need not merely grieve the Christian. From a post-resurrection perspective, sin indirectly gives opportunity to praise the creating and redeeming Lord for his gracious deliverance. That's Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 36. Link in description, by the way. Sin is defined extensively. So what does theology say about sin? According to God's question or org sin is defined as sin is described in the bible as a transgression of the law of god first john chapter 3 verse 4 and rebellion against god deuteronomy 9 7 joshua 1 18 sin has its beginning with lucifer probably the most beautiful and powerful of the angels not content with his position he desired to be higher than god and that was his downfall at the beginning of sin isaiah chapter 14 verses 12 through 15 renamed satan he brought sin to the human race in the garden of eden where he tempted adam and eve with the same enticement, ye shall be like God. Genesis chapter 3 describes Adam and Eve's rebellion against God and against his command. Since that time, sin has been passed down through all the generations of mankind, and we, Adam's descendants, have inherited sin from him. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 tells us that through Adam, sin entered the world, and so death was passed on to all men because the wages of sin is death. Romans chapter 6 verse 23. Through Adam... The inherent inclination to sin entered the human race, and human beings became sinners by nature. When Adam sinned, his inner nature was transformed by his sin of rebellion, bringing to him spiritual death and depravity, which would be passed on to all who came after him. We are sinners not because we sin, rather we sin because we are sinners. This passed on depravity is known as inherited sin. Just as we inherit physical characteristics from our parents, we inherit our sinful natures from Adam, King David lamented this condition of fallen human nature in Psalm 51, 5. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Another type of sin is known as imputed sin. Using both financial and legal settings, the Greek word translated imputed means to take something that belongs to someone and credit it to another's account. Before the law of Moses was given, sin was not imputed to man, although men were still sinners because of inherited sin. The law was given, sin committed in violation of the law were imputed and accounted to them. Romans chapter 5 verse 13. Even before the transgressions of the law were imputed to men, the ultimate penalty of sin, death, continued to reign. Romans chapter 5 verse 14. All humans from Adam to Moses were subject to death, not because of their sinful acts against the Mosaic law, which they did not have, but because of their own inherited sinful nature. After Moses, humans were subject to death both because of inherited sin from man and imputed sin from violating the laws of God. God used the principle of imputation to benefit mankind when he imputed the sin of believers to the account of Jesus Christ, who paid the penalty for that sin, death on the cross. Imputing our sin to Jesus, God created him as he were a sinner, though he was not, and had him die for the sins of the entire world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. It is important to understand that sin was imputed to him, 
but he did not inherit it from Adam. He bore the penalty of sin, but he was never became a sinner. His pure and perfect nature wasn't touched by sin. He was treated as though he were guilty of all the sins ever committed by the human race, even though he committed none. In exchange, God imputed the righteousness of Christ to believers and credited our accounts with his righteousness, just as he had credited our sins to Christ's account. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. A third type of sin is personal sin, that which is committed every day by every human being. Because we have inherited a sin nature from Adam, we commit individual personal sins, everything from seemingly innocent untruths to murder. Those who have not placed their faith in Jesus Christ must pay penalty for these personal sins, as well as inherited and imputed sin. However, believers have been freed from the eternal penalty of sin, hell and spiritual death, but now we also have the power to resist sinning. Now we have chosen whether or not to commit personal sins because we have the power to resist sin through the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, sanctifying and convicting us of our sins when we do commit them. Romans chapter 8 verses 9 through 11. Once we confess our personal sins to God and ask forgiveness for them, we are restored to perfect fellowship and communion with Him. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. We are all three times condemned due to inherited sin, imputed sin, and personal sin. The only just penalty for this sin is death, Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Not just physical death, but eternal death, Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. Thankfully, inherited sin, imputed sin, and personal sin have all been crucified on the cross of Jesus, and now, by faith in Jesus Christ as a Savior, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of His grace. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7. Link in the description, by the way. Sin is, can be defined as harming others in its simplest form. In its basic form, sin is rebellion against God. Hatred and anger are both described as sin. With hatred, the hatred of others being total anathema to God because God is love and those who are dominated by hatred are separated from God for their open rebellion. When it comes to the law of consequences, God created the first universal law of law of consequences as accounted for the fallenness of our human nature. Due to the fall of man, when you don't repent and atone, God will either place the consequences soon or later and very well, much later, since God is a father, has to discipline their children as a parent has to when the child is in rebellion, disobedient, and harming others. Those who espouse cheap grace and other false doctrines such as once saved, always saved, we will begin to this later, preach that a Christian, once you are saved, you don't have to repent and ask for forgiveness or atone for anything you do, especially what you do to others, be it belittling them or otherwise, or harming others you hate, etc. Since you are saved and that grace protects you, redeems you, which, of course, these fallen preachers, teachers, false prophets preach this so they can keep on sinning, harming others, and hating others while not repenting and continuing their open rebellion against God instead of submitting to his will. This is cheap grace, and as Dietrich Bonhoeffer has stated, cheap grace is another word for damnation. So what does the Bible say concerning false prophets? Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciousness are seared, who forbid marriage and require absence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. That's 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 through 5. I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do you bear with me? For I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betroth you to the one husband to resent you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as a serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will lead, be led astray from the sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus, than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough.
Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way we have made this plain to you in all things. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preach God's gospel for you free of charge? I robbed other churches by accepting the support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone, for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I did not love you. God knows I do. And what I am doing and will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ, and no wonder even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if the servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. And that's 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 15. So, preachers of hate. So, like uh, right-wing uh, pastor Greg Locke, for example, which we'll be talking about later, and everything that is happening to him. In accordance, because, again, that end will, of course, come to their deeds. Let's continue. <clears throat> Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into this world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And that's 1 John chapter 4, verses 1-6. through 6. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the city of the Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over the lawless deeds and he saw and heard. And then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of final judgment. And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and will willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them because of the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the way to their wrongdoing. They count it with pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blossom and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery and satiability for evil. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained with greed, accursed children, forsaking the right way. They have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but also was rebuked for his own transgression, and speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm, 
For them the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved, for speaking loud boasts of folly, they enticed by sensual passions of the flesh, those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world, through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them to never have known the way of righteousness after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to his own vomit and the sow after washing herself returns to the wallowing in the mire. And that's 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 22 in the standardized version. That is the thing about fallenness. People returning their sins after the taste of salvation, the dog returning to his vomit, and the sow returning to wallowing in the mire after being cleaned and made new. Without spiritual discipline and a desire for the change, people return to their own set ways and become lost, fallen, cast away in the process. Those who follow the false doctrine, once saved, always saved, are the sow returning the wallowing in the mire. They are Christians upon salvation, but once they were saved, they believed they could do all that they wish and still be Christians, which, of course, there are things that will no longer make you of Christ. So what is the false doctrine, once saved, always saved? According to the article, the myth of once saved, always saved, debunking the false doctrines, the false doctrine, once saved, always saved, is defined as... Few false doctrines are more dangerous than the Calvinistic assertion of eternal security, or once saved, always saved. This belief has become perverse far beyond theological academia's reach. Once saved, always saved is a popular mantra of the average low-information Christian. It crosses denominational lines, bleeds between theological spectrums, and slips into everyday dogmas. The doctrine of eternal security essentially states that nothing can cause them to be disfellowshipped from God once a person is saved. Without going too deep, it should be noted that there are numerous variations and machinations of this doctrine. In its most extreme form, a person could theoretically be saved and murder his wife while remaining unconditionally saved. Others would assert that if someone were to commit such a heinous act, he was never truly saved in the first place. Sadly, this dangerous doctrine flatly contradicts scripture and is common we use as a smokescreen to justify sinful lifestyles. In other words, once saved, always saved appeals to the most carnal leanings of our humanity. It gives false legitimacy for sin, false comfort to sinners, and builds a pseudo-biblical barrier between countless sinners and repentance. The doctrine of eternal security flatly contradicts scripture, and it is commonly used as a smokescreen to justify sinful lifestyles. In other words, once saved, always saved, appeals to the most carnal leanings of her humanity, the doctrine of eternal security gives false legitimacy for sin, false comfort to sinners, and builds a pseudo-biblical barrier between countless sinners and repentance. It's eerie how the Calvinistic notion of eternal security shares similarities with Satan's seduction of Eve in the garden. The serpent assured Eve, ye shall not surely die, Genesis 3, 4. The satanic implication being that Eve could live in disobedience without the fear of divine consequences. The doctrine of eternal security makes the same false claim. It originates from the same satanic source. It is a primal passage of scripture used to prop up the concept of once saved, always saved. Who shall separate from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution, famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for, the, for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor ages, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ our Lord. Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39. The doctrine of eternal security shares similarity with Satan's seduction of Eve in the Garden of Eden. Satan said, Ye shall not surely die. The implication being that Eve could live in disobedience without fear of divine consequences. First of all, this is a tremendously encouraging passage of scripture, but it talks about 
God's unconditional love, not unconditional salvation. With close examination, you'll find that sin is not once mentioned in the context of this promise. As with other passages used to support OSAS, John 3.15, John 5.24, John 10.28, Romans 8.1, 1 Corinthians 10.13, the emphasis is always on external forces having no authority over your personal responsibilities towards God. Let us put it this way. Nothing can force you to separate yourself from God except you. Satan can't make you do, do it any more than he made Eve do it. Eve exercised her free will, Adam exercised his free will, and they both suffered the consequences of their actions. Sin separates us from the right relationship with God, but it does not remove us from the love of God. For example, God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. God loves us even while we are in sin, but to say the cross made sin acceptable is to undermine the cross's necessity in the first place completely. The phrasing, while we were yet sinners, shows Paul's assumption that believers would naturally understand sinful lifestyles must be discarded after salvation. Furthermore, the Apostle Paul, Apostle Peter, calls us to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, who did not sin. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 22. A few verses down, he underscores that Jesus bare our sins in his own body on the tree, and that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness. For ye were a sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. First Peter chapter two verses twenty four through twenty five. <clears throat> Nothing can force you to separate yourself from God except you. Satan can't make you do it any more than he made Eve do it. Eve exercised her free will, Adam exercised her free will, and they both suffered the consequences of their actions. God loves us even while we are in sin but to say that cross made sin acceptable is to undermine the cross's necessity in the first place completely. But we still haven't sufficiently debunked the doctrine of eternal security. Few people would argue against the scriptural emphasis on living above sin. Many would say that righteous living is the best way, but not a requirement for heaven after obedience to the gospel. So let's take a look at several scriptures that prove that it is possible to throw away our salvation and trample upon the grace of God and grieve the Holy Spirit in the process. The parable of the sower gives us insight in the issue at hand. Jesus speaks of individuals who receive the gospel immediately with joy, but when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, they fall away. Mark chapter 4, verse 16, Luke chapter 8, verse 13. Consider these self-examinatory scriptures from the book of Hebrews. For it is possible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again upon repentance, seeing them crucified to themselves, ascending God afresh, and put them upon open shame. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for a judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 27. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall not have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, destruction, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 38 through 39. Additionally, Peter speaks plainly of people who return and are overcome by the pollutions of the world, saying that it would be better if they had never known the way of righteousness in the first place. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. But the words of Jesus are the most important, not the most potent. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have we cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. That's Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. We could go on and demonstrating the scriptural imperative that we must not depart from the faith post-salvation or risk divine judgment, or a.k.a. damnation.
And I'll link you in the description for that, by the way. You can do things that will no longer make you of Christ. You can do things that will remove the Holy Spirit from you, allowing something else in. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9 concerning being a castaway. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives a prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control. Thus after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. In your standard version. If you cannot have self-control concerning sins, you can be cast away. You can be disqualified, and God will reject you. We see many Christians continue to believe they can dominate and harm others they hate, be it political, race, sexual, gender, sexual orientation, gender orientation, etc. Hatred is separation from God. It is anathema to God. This is why cheap grace and false doctrines have led so many Christians astray, believing they can do all that they wish, that no one has authority over them, and they are the gods of their own lives. They do not submit to God, and do not allow God to have control, which leads them on the broad path instead of the straight and narrow, and to their own damnation. They use whatever justification for their sins and continue to sin, especially in the domination and harming of others they hate, and further their own damnation giving in to the temptations, demonic suggestions, harming others, and continuing their open rebellion against God, and being in direct opposition to God, knowingly or otherwise. Yes, you can disqualify yourself from being of Christ. Those who are cast away are to be winnowed, cast out of Christianity, excommunicated, at least until they actually repent and atone, and be treated as excommunicated, a non-believer, until they desire to change and return to God. Let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 6. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying against the foundation of repentance of dead works and of faith towards God, and of the instruction of the washing, laying on hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment, and this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God, and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up for contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls in and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated and receives a blessing from God, but if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed and its ends to be burned. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation, for God is not unjust as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness with that full assurance of hope until the last day, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherited the promises. Hebrews chapter 6 verses 1 through 12 in the Standard Version. Hebrews chapter 6 asserts the winnowing. Those Christians who fell were to be cast out, for they were cast away, being rejected by God. Having to watch pastors preach false doctrines such as once saved, always saved, cheap grace, and, peach, and teach hatred, like Christian nationalist pastor Greg Locke, they are grieving the Holy Spirit. This is why excommunication is warranted. These same types of preachers who preach hatred, radicalizing and indoctrinate people who share their hatred to ultimately kill people, like the mass shooter of Buffalo, New York, or Christian churches becoming so warped as to bless wars and atrocities such as we are seeing in Ukraine and being complicit to evil in the process. God will not hold guiltless. Again, it starts with the mixing of the good and the bad. We Christians have a responsibility to hold to legal accountability, those who teach, preach hatred, and we also are to stand up, denounce, or renounce hatred and wrong. We can't fight hatred with anything else but love, compassion, kindness, and accountability. Through legal accountability, the person gets a, to atone for what they've done. They get the mental health help they desperately need. They get to repent and get to know of God. And this is why accountability is love. As a reminder, 
What is the definition of Satanism which many Christians these days, Christian nationalists especially, adhere to? In the natural test explains the demonic, the antics of Satan and his army of fallen angels. Father Gabriel Amorath defines Satanism as What is their objective? Satanists wish to develop this depraved form of devotion through the diffusion of the theory and practice of three basic principles. You can do all that you wish, known as the right to command you, and you are the god of yourself. The first principle intends to confer full liberty to the adhered on everything he wishes to do without limits. The second is released from the principle of authority, that is, from any obligation of a parent or church to Satan whoever places restrictions in the name of the common good. The third denies all the truth that comes directly from God, paradise, the Inferno, Purgatory, Judgment, and the Ten Commandments, and the Precepts of Mary, and so forth. In appearance, these principles are seductive, especially for younger people, because they delude them to thinking that life is a beautiful holiday, an imaginary land of playthings, where everything is permitted, and where your eye does not recognize any limits regarding pleasure and enjoyment. Link in the description, by the way. Father Gabriel Amaris goes further on this. I wish to conclude with an important observation. It is not necessary to become a Satanist in order to serve the devil and become one of its followers. There are many, alas, who do not officially consecrate themselves to Satan, but choose to follow his basic principles, and as a result, they place their souls at great risk. So, aka when a fallen Christian follows uh, Satan's uh, three principles, they can do all that they wish, especially to others that no one has the right to command them, and that they are the gods themselves, so okay, they don't submit to God, for that matter. So, when they follow these precepts, as we see so many fallen Christians do these days, again, this is why they would be considered Satanists, but not officially consecrated to Satan. But they chose to follow his three basic principles regardless, that willful choice, and they put themselves at great spiritual peril. And this is the reality that we have to look at. Because again, once saved, always saved. It's cheap grace, and it's a devil doctrine. So, when a Christian believes they can do all that they wish, especially others such as belittling, trying to dominate, physically harming others, and worse, that is that no one has authority over them, they don't obey parents, moral authority, the government, or whoever places legal restrictions, limitations on what they can do, and concerning the common good, and that they are the gods themselves, they are in control, they do not submit to God, these persons are absolutely fallen. They do not repent and believe they can harm, dominate others, and believe God allows them, and the Holy Spirit isn't in them. They place their souls at great risk for their full self-autonomy instead of following Christ and the limitations placed on us as Christians. I do affirm this as a legally ordained reverend. As a reminder concerning fallenness, here is a good quote. Satan disguises submission to himself under the ruse of personal autonomy. He never asks us to become his servants. Never once did the serpent say to Eve, I want to be your master. The shift in commitment is never from Christ to evil, it is always from Christ to self. And instead of his will, self-interest now rules in what I want reigns. And that is the essence of sin. That's from an unknown theologian. Your words and your actions do matter. They determine if you are of Christ or not, and you cannot be careless with your words or your actions either. For it will be canon for against you during the final judgment. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make its tree corrupt and its fruit, and fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, but the good person out of the good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. That's Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 through 37 in the standardized version. So before we dive further into this, let's take a look at the Buffalo Shooter. According to the article, the Buffalo Shooter had a toothache, an extremist expert explains the bizarre reason why it matters. NBC News reporter Ben Collins on Friday added important context to how the white supremacist accused of murdering 10 people in the Buffalo mass shooting was radicalized. Collins covers online disinformation and drew upon his experience tracking extremism to know the key detail about suspect Peyton Grandin's motivations. I want to tell a quick story, Collins began a thread post on Twitter. The Buffalo shooter had a toothache, he noted before explaining that why that detail is important. 
You may have heard this by now, but the Buffalo shooter spent six months before the shooting messaging himself on Discord. He did it the same way you would email yourself a reminder. It was every stray thought he had for half a year, archived as a sort of handbook, he explained. Peyton Grandon, the 18-year-old murder suspect, planned the shooting for months and scoped out the location ahead of time, according to a stream of posts attributed to him on social media sites. Grandon first wrote about killing black people in December and decided to target the Buffalo store based on the surrounding African-American population, according to his media analysis of hundreds of pages of messages. In that Discord archive that's over 500 pages, the Buffalo shooter wrote about where he wanted to attack his true motivations, even how badly he needed a haircut. Minutes before the shooting, he sent it to all the people he talked to on Discord, plus he live streamed the shooting. Collins continued. The Discord archive was more illustrative than the manifest itself, manifesto, because it's what he actually believed and not a knockoff term paper that plagiarized past mass shooters. And in it, one thing kept coming up the Buffalo shooter had a toothache he couldn't fix. Collins noted, the Buffalo shooter apparently tried to get his back to treated. He went to a dentist, and whatever the dentist tried didn't fix it. He didn't or couldn't go anywhere else. He alluded to insurance problems, but instead of blaming insurance or himself, he blamed the Jews. He wrote, the Buffalo shooter blamed the dentist, who he said was Jewish, but also Jews in general, who is convinced were the cause of all of his suffering. In his writing, Grennan said he came by his views while surfing the often radical discussion site 4chan and other conspiracy theory websites amid extreme boredom during the COVID lock times. Much of this manifesto is lifted directly from the great replacement text posted by the Christchurch killer Britain Turrent, which claims that white Europeans are threatened by ethnic replacement and genocide. Link in the description, by the way. Again, that hatred, scapegoating others for problems. Narcissists do this a lot, by the way. Which, again, narcissism is a diagnosed mental illness, according to DSM-5. We have seen this before in history. In the modern era, we had Hitler and the Nazis and the genocide that followed. In the Ukraine war that's currently going on, the Russian Orthodox Church blessed Putin's war, especially concerning their own hatreds of portions of the Ukrainians, and we are witnessing the atrocities being committed by Putin's regime in the Russian Orthodox ideology that mirrors Nazism's ideology. Unfortunately, yes, when church weds itself to the state, this is what is Christian nationalism, which is pure antichrist. Their blood and soil ideology, link in the description is for that, by the way. So what the shooter was radicalized on was ideology that Christian nationalists here in America, for the most part, have adhered to, in part thanks to listening to hate-mongering, fear-mongering, fallen Christians, politicians, and certain TV presenters. God did not give us a spirit of fear or hate especially. So what is the spirit of hate? As a refresher, according to the article, the different types of demonic spirits on Bible.net by Michael Bradley specifies, Satan still has not changed his tactics or strategies. He still uses both demons and other people to try to get us to fall into various types of sins. But whether we are coming under any kind of direct influence from demons or other people, the choice will always remain with us as to whether or not we will fall for a temptation to sin directly against the Lord. All demons can do is try and make you do bad and evil things, and unless you are dealing with a case of temporary possession or someone who has become mentally ill in some way, most of the time the person will have all of his senses fully intact enough to know right from wrong, and we will know and will know that the full consequence of their actions will be if they decide to go all the way through with it. A good example of this are the people who murder their loved ones in a fit of rage and jealousy. Many of the times these crimes are premeditated, which means the person is actually thinking about it and planning on how to do it. Once they've gotten this type of planning stage, the demons will then try to keep the pressure on from the back end to try and get them to fall all the way through with it. But the person can still stop it and call it off any time they want to. They know full well what the consequences are going to be if they get caught life imprisonment or the death penalty, but in many of these cases they will still fall all the way through with it and actually kill their spouse or whoever else they have targeted. Demons with functional names of murder, rage, and hate, and many of the types of the driving force behind these types of horrible crimes. But again, the person is still fully cooperating with these demons with their own free will, and as a result, they will be held totally accountable and responsible both by the law if they are ever caught, and by God himself once they die and cross over to face him head on in their own personal judgment. 
Most of the time, people have no idea that it really is demons who are operating behind the scenes, providing more fuel to their fires with what they specialize in, such as spirits of hate, murder, jealousy, rage, anger, bitterness, and unforgiveness. Once a group of these types of demons attach to a person who may have been really hurt in a love affair or a spouse being divorced or by another spouse or a spouse catching another spouse in an adulterous love affair, they will then try and do everything they can to slam the person with what they specialize in as to try and get them to act out of these negative feelings and emotions. These types of demons and the ones who specialize in the cult are the two worst type, ki types of demons you can ever come across. In this first group are the demons who specialize in trying to set people up to murder and kill. This will include demons who will try and get people to either kill themselves in the form of suicide or kill other people in cold-blooded murders. There is not a day that goes by where we do not hear a report in our local news station the murder or suicide of an individual people in this life. In fact, it is so common and so prevalent that we have become literally desensitized to all this since we hear about so much on a daily basis. It's only when it happens to someone who may be close to us that we are given the full realization of how evil an act of murder and suicide really is, and it should happen to be very close loved one, like your child, your spouse, or your parent. It will rip your heart into a million pieces and leave a hole in your soul that will never fully go away until you cross over to the other side to be with Jesus for all eternity. Through the power of the Holy Spirit who, on the inside of you, God can heal and help heal the emotional wounds of this kind of trauma, but you will never lose the actual memory of the event or the sadness at losing a close loved one in such a horrible, evil, and senseless fashion. The Bible has ready, already given us fair warning that Satan and his demons have come to kill, steal, and destroy. And until Jesus comes back to set up some in the city of Jerusalem, we are all going to have to battle this kind of evil reality on a regular basis, whether we like it or not. As such, it will really help everyone if they can learn how the enemy will try and operate against them. Here are some of the main function names of the demons who specialize in this kind of extreme evil activity. Murder, rage, anger, violence, death, revenge, destruction, darkness, suicide, jealousy, sadism, fighting. As we have said before, demons usually travel in groups or clusters with one demon being the chief demon and the rest of the demons being his underlings under his direct control and direction. In many of these types of cases, the chief demon will try will be a spirit of murder, and then he will have his underlings having some of the functional names listed above. They will then move in and set up shop on someone if they have the appropriate legal rights to be able to do so, and they will then try and work and play that person over a period of time to either try and get them to kill themselves or other people, or possibly both as murder suicides are still very common to this day and age. Again, in most of these cases, a person is not in fully possessed state. They still have most, if not all, their senses fully intact and know basic right from wrong. The demon will plant their thoughts, their suggestions, their pictures, and their mind's eye, and their strategies on how to do it. But the person can still resist these types of evil temptations at any time and choose not to act out on them. Demons cannot make you do anything against your own free will. All they can do is try and persuade you to do it, along with trying to give you the actual desire and compulsion to want to do it. From there, the choice will be up to that person as to whether or not they will want to go all the way through with it and to actually act down these evil desires being implanted into them by demons. It simply amazes me how so many people will blindly follow these kinds of evil demonic suggestions and promptings and actually carry out acts of pure cold-blooded murders on either themselves or anyone else the demons have targeted for them. Just because you get an evil thought or an evil desire to kill either yourself or someone else does not mean you have to actually try and carry it out. Again, People need to be taught the basics on how demons will try and play mind games with you so as they can get you to try to do their evil bidding. The mind is the battlefield in the area of spiritual warfare with both demons and God trying to reach you through your mind. God will be trying to transform and renew your mind through his word and demons will try to reach your mind so they can get you to act out their evil suggestions. Link in the description, by the way. So yes. There are types of demonic spirits that Lucifer uses to tempt people and give demonic suggestions to you to harm others. As a reminder, a demon cannot make a person do what they don't already want to do. You as a person always have a choice and can decide not to do the act deed that would harm someone that you are tempted with. For again, 
Satan has come to destroy those he can enthrall to aside the spirit of anger and the spirit of hate being chief among these. Christians dominated by these are easily seen and known by their words and their actions. There is a clear divide between who is an actual Christian and who isn't a Christian. Anyone who fails to imagine his day, 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21, regardless if they are a racist or a xenophobe, isn't a Christian, officially or otherwise, and I do have to affirm this as a legal or ordained reverend. So what is hatred and why is it so dangerous? As a refresher, according to GodQuestion.org's article, what does the Bible say about hate? Hate is defined as... Biblically speaking, there are positive and negative aspects to hatred. It is acceptable to hate those things that God hates. Indeed, it is very much proof of the right standard with God. Let those who love the Lord hate evil, Psalm 9710a. Indeed, the closer our walk with the Lord and the more we fo have fellowship with him, the more conscious we will be of sin, both within and without. Do we not grieve and burn with anger when God's name is maligned when we see spiritual hypocrisy? as with the fallen Christians, for example. When we see blatant unbelief and godless behavior from the said fallen Christians, the more we understand God's attributes and love his character, the more we will be like him and the more we will hate those things that are contrary to his word and nature. However, the hatred that is negative surely has to be that which is directed against others. The Lord mentions hatred in the Sermon on the Mount but I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. The Lord commands that not only should be reconciled with their brothers before we go before the Lord, but also that we do it quickly. Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 through 26. The act of murder itself was certainly condemned, but hatred is a hard sin, and any hateful thought or act is an act of murder in God's eye, for which justice will be demanded, possibly not in this life, but in the, at the judgment. So heinous is the position of hate before God, that a man who hates is said to be walking in darkness, as opposed to light. First John chapter 2, verse 9 and 11. The worst situation is that a man who continues professing religion, but remains at enmity with his brother. The scripture declares that such a person is a liar, First John 4, 20, and he may fool men, but not God. How can, how many believers live for years, pretending that all is well, putting up a front, only to be found finally wanting, because they harbored enmity, hatred against a fellow believer. Hatred is a poison that destroys us from within, producing bitterness that eats away at our hearts and minds. This is why the scriptures tell us not to let a root of bitterness spring up in our hearts, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Hatred also destroys the personal witness of a Christian because it removes him from fellowship with the Lord and other believers. Let us be careful to do as the Lord advises and keep short accounts with everyone without everything, no matter how small, and the Lord will be faithful to forgive as he has promised. First John chapter 1 verses 9 and First John chapter 2 verse 1. Link in the description, by the way. Hatred is a corruption, cancer, and poison. Hatred is sin. We saw it manifest before Trump's presidency. We saw it spread highly rapidly during his presidency thanks to the hate-mongering, fear-mongering, and saw it manifest and still manifesting. We see all these threats of violence and worse, people being dominated by the spirits of anger and hatred. They give in to conspiracy theories, rant about harming others, and give in to the demonic suggestions and actually do harm others. We do see these types of fallen Christians um, who believe they can do all that they wish, especially to others, that no one has authority over them, that they are the gods of their own lives. They are in control and do not submit to God. For a mental health equivalent, narcissism, a confirmed mental health illness, according to DSM-5, is this, and as stated, they desperately need mental health help. Of course, we see this throughout the world as well. We see this with the war, war of Ukraine and Russia's atrocities and continued atrocities with the blessing and complicity of evil, and complicity to evil, of Russian Orthodox Church. Headed by a patriarch hero, and we got to witness it yet again here in the U.S. with the Buffalo, New York mass shooting, and of course with the uh, shooting in Texas. We see the dangers of hatred, but as a refresher, according to Christian.com's article, Why is Hatred So Dangerous? by Bethany Verrett, hatred is defined as 
The root of evil is rebellion against God, his nature and his will. People cave into their fleshy desires, whether instinctively or intentionally, when they set themselves against God. The Bible makes it clear that God is love, he is the source of love, the giver of true life, and because of that love will continue into eternity, since he is eternal. Hate is a sinful opposition to that love. It is the driving force behind much of the wicked action people take. Sometimes it is hating others, hating a process, or hating oneself. God's word has much to say on the topic, emphasizing its toxic influence, pernicious nature, and how much it hurts the Lord. It is selfish emotion that sets man against his creator and his brethren, damaging everything it touches because it allows people to see their fellow man as not also made in the image of God. To know the love of God is to be touched by true love and embracing that enables people to overcome the fleshly desire of hate and become more Christ-like. Likely, many topics, the Bible is not silent about hatred. It is the opposite emotion and behavior that Christ Jesus epitomized when he came to die on the cross, paying the price for the sins of humanity. The dictionary defined it as ill will or resentment that is actually mutual. Or that's usually mutual. Prejudice, hostility, or animosity. This definition does not seem to fully encapsulate hatred, as it is often the driving force of the worst of human behavior, including murder, the intentional ending of a life. God's word gives many powerful statements on what hate is. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. James chapter 1, verse 19. Where there is conflict, there is the potential of hate. It leads to discord, disharmony, malice, and anger. The negative emotion is tied up with which with leads to sin. Hate is a motivator for wicked behavior, and the Bible helps identify hate by showing how indulging it leads to certain outcomes. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. First John chapter three verse fifteen. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. But you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. Leviticus 19.17 The one who conceals hatred has lying lips, and whoever utters slander is a fool. Proverbs 10.18 What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder, you cover and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. James chapter 4, verses 1-2a through 2a. The world indulges in hate and ultimately sets itself against God by hating its people, highlighted in several verses, and you will be hated for by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it and that it works are evil. John 7, 7. I have given them... Your God's word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. John 17, verse 14. Hate is not just an emotion, it is a state of being that involves choices, behaviors, and thoughts. It separates people rather than brings them together because the one hating sets themselves away from another. They can do it for superficial reasons or understandable ones. Racism is an example of hatred driven by ethnic differences. Some people hate others due to religious differences. Individuals often hate one another due to past wrongs, refusing to seek reconciliation. Ultimately, hate can lead to people not seeing the object of their hatred as fully human, justifying bad behavior on either a petty or a grand scale. Many people experience anger. Some even have tempers that manifest in ways that are detrimental to their relationships. Getting mad at someone does not mean the relationship is hateful. Even modern psychology identified differences between the two, with anger being a passing emotion, even for those who struggle with anger management. Hate actively separates people from one another because it is an active decision to otherwise, a word that means to view, to treat it intrinsically evil, different, and to treat it as intrinsically evil, different from alien to oneself. This refers to someone being seen as so alien to oneself or a culture that they can be perceived as lesser, perhaps even less than human. Sorry about the tumbling over there. Instead of seeing people as made in the image of God, they can be eliminated. Anger can lead to hate and often feels it, but that does not necessarily mean they are the same. 
patriotic people to set themselves in opposition to God as well, meaning actions driven by hatred are rebellion. One of the most powerful statements in the Bible comes from the last epistle of the New Testament written by one of the apostles, John wrote, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or a sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. 1 John chapter 3, verses 14-15. This verse makes the bold claim that if anyone calls himself a Christian, but is hateful against anyone, especially a non-believer, they may not have the Holy Spirit and may not be truly saved. Hate is intimately tied with death. And just like Jesus called someone embracing lust an adulterer, someone harboring hate is murdering his brother in his heart. When this hate is acted upon, it leads to death. Sometimes that is spiritual or relational, unfortunately, it can also be the ending of a life or another. Hate is dangerous because when taken to its logical conclusion, it is the desire to eliminate the humanity of another. Link in the description, by the way. Hatred, racism, xenophobia, homophobia, transphobia, etc., all count as hatred regardless. It's active rebellion against God. Hatred is direct opposition to God, and subsequently, hatred is separation from God. Many Christians these days are consumed, dominated by their hatreds, and are walking in perpetual darkness. Separation from God and separated from God by their own hatred. When people are consumed by hatred, as stated, the Holy Spirit is no longer in them. Those who can exemplify the fruits of the Spirit, but the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23. So those who cannot exemplify the fruits of the Spirit in their lives, or in daily lives especially, the Holy Spirit isn't in them. And I have to affirm this, by the way. The Holy Spirit is no longer in those consumed by hatred. Something else has replaced it in them. The spirit of hate, the spirit of anger, amongst other things concerning exorcism, church doctrinal views. In America, there is so much hatred and so many fallen Christians are cast away, believing falsely, thanks to the false doctrine once they are always saved, that their sins are covered and that they cannot only continue to harm others, but they justify the harm they can cause others and subsequently being used by Lucifer to do the work for him. In the rest of the world, we are outright witnessing this and more in the war in Ukraine, the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church killed and supporters of Putin's war, and subsequently our complicity to evil and complicity to the atrocities we are witnessing in Ukraine. Their blood and soil rhetoric doctrine is both racist and xenophobic. Both count as hatred, of course, since it in the rhetoric, they see their enemies as less than human. With all the mass graves we've seen, the summary executions of civilians by the Russian army in Ukraine, the rapings committed by Russian soldiers on both Christ children and women, the elimination of people that they see as less than human is quite evident, as irrevocably proven. Lucifer uses those with hate in their hearts to do unspeakable evils. So how does one go about fighting temptation? Here are a few excerpts from an exorcist explains the monk, the antics of Satan's army of fallen angels, by Father Gabriel Amroth concerning this. Satan's mission is well explained by the Apostle Peter. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking some to devour. 1 Peter chapter 5 8. We can interpret that devouring as doing harm, bring to perdition. The devil's mission in the world is to deceive souls, to lead them, lead each man and woman on a wayward path of sin. The principal oath of this tragic mission is a path to temptation. Each one of us must fight against the temptation of sin for as long as we live. Indeed, sin leads to death. It should not be surprised anyone, and I shall speak, speak, speak of it shortly, but if I say that there are more victims of Satan's ordinary action than of his extraordinary action, we are all victims of temptation. But only some are victims of extraordinary action of Satan, but never through their own fault. Therefore, they are not morally responsible. Temptation assaults us each holy day. Jesus himself submitted temptation during the 40 days he spent in the desert after his baptism in the Jordan. See Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And later on, the devil tempts us both in our natural dimension, that is, in our interior wounds and weaknesses, and through the various occasions of sin that present themselves to us. Temptation is dangerous because it is difficult to uncover in the folds of our thoughts, words, actions, and omissions. Discernment is necessary, that is, we must have a well-trained eye and a spiritual intelligence 
That helps us to recognize the claw of the tempter and those who bring us straight to sin. We must reject them and instead accept the good inspirations that come from God. Therefore, it is necessary to guard our heart and our external senses from indecent spectacles. Each one of us becomes what we see, what we listen to, and what we read. Therefore, let us be discerning in what we see, listen to, and above all, let us choose good friends. <clears throat> it is necessary to have a well-informed conscience. A good conscience is not achieved by elevating oneself or worse, yet allowing the dominant culture to arbitrate good and bad. A good conscience is obtained by confirming one's will to God's will and his to his teachings, which are given to us for our happiness and our salvation and are summarized in the highest degree in the commandments. Temptation is conquest by vigilance, avoiding sin and praying, because without the help of God, we are not capable of conquering the seduction of sin. No one is exempt from temptation. Some of the saints have had tremendous temptations even on their deathbeds. From their testimonies, we understand that as long as we have breath, we shall never be free of temptation. The loss of a sense of sin that characterizes our era helps Satan act nearly undisturbed and in inducing man to sin, takes man progressively away from the love of God. Everything is lawful. What is wrong there? Everyone does it. These are the suggestions that weaken the consciousness of men and women and lead them to the path towards closing their hearts, egoism, lack of forgiveness, and doing everything for money, power, and sex. Everything that seduces and enslaves souls leads to their death, which is Satan's objective. The ordinary temptations of the devil are played mainly in the area of intelligence. Let us think the many theoretical errors that are passed off as modern ideas in order to unhinge the principles of the faith, as in all the new lifestyles that are contrary to morality. What is the cause of this moral decline? Principally, is the diminution of the Christian conscience and the struggles against the power of darkness. It is St. Paul who warns us, for we are not contending against the flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rules of this present darkness, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 6, 12. Here's how the Vatican II frames the situation. When the order of values is jumbled and the bad is mixed with the good, individuals and groups pay heed solely to their own interests and not to those of others. Thus it happens that the world ceases to be a place of true brotherhood. In our own day, the magnified power of humanity threatens to destroy the race itself. Where a monumental struggle against the powers of darkness pervades the whole history of man, the battle is joined from the very origin of the world and will continue until the last day, as the Lord has attested. Matthew chapter 24, verse 13, verses, Matthew chapter 13, verses 20 through 30, and 36 through 43. Cause this conflict, man is obligated to wrestle constantly if he is to cling to what is good, nor can he achieve his own integrity without great efforts and the help of God's grace. Many fallen Christians mix the bad with the good, thanks to the false doctrine of one saved, all saved, and other cheap grace doctrines. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in the Cost of Discipleship defines cheap grace as, Instead of following Christ, let the Christian enjoy the consolations of his grace. That is what we mean by cheap grace, the grace which amounts to justification of sin without the justification of the repentant sinner who departs from sin and whom sin departs. Cheap grace is not the kind of forgiveness of sin which frees us from toils of sin. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Link in the description, by the way. Sins cannot be justified, especially justified beforehand, and those who do such things are absolutely fallen. Fallen, fallenness can be defined as continuing to sin without repentance. Given we humans are creatures of habit concerning psychology, so when the habit of harming others, since sin is defined as harming others, is daily and persons try to justify it with false doctrines and do not repent, they are what is, can be defined as fallen and absolutely so, since they are rejected by God and are cast away. Yes, you can do things that will no longer make you of Christ, and God will reject you for it. So what is the Magnus Day, and why is it so important? 1 John chapter 4, verses 17-21 encapsulates the Magnus Day. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God has sent His only Son to the world, so that we might live through Him. 
And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that you've loved us since then in the appropriation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent and sent him to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe that the love God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. Who will never fear has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. So when it comes to the majesty, majesty according to the church doctrine, racism, xenophobia, hatred in general is a moral evil. According to late Archbishop Harry J. Flynn, in his In the Image of God pastoral letter on racism, he describes the majesty and anti-majesty as, in our natural, national pastoral letter on racism, we bishops noted how racism as rejection of the most basic values of the scriptures, God's word proclaimed the oneness of human family from the first words of Genesis to the come, Lord Jesus, come in the book of Revelation. God's word in Genesis announces that all men and women are created in God's image, not just some races and racial types, but all bear the imprint of the creator and, and are enlivened by the breath of his one spirit. Racism mocks the words of Jesus. It treats others the way you would have them treat you. Indeed, racism is more than a disregard of the word of Jesus. It is a denial of the truth of the dignity of each human being being revealed by the mystery of incarnation. Those words remind us how seriously racism violates God's will for us. It contradicts the meaning of the incarnation and threatens our salvation. With the incarnation, Jesus entered human history to transcend and transform the divisions of human sinfulness. He calls us to communion with one another, a unity that reflects the unity of God's own being in the Holy Trinity. In his life, Jesus modeled this unity and deep reverence for the dignity of each person he met. Whether it was a Samaritan woman, the tax collector, the leper, or the prostitute, Jesus treated all people with the reverence that is due, their due as children of God. We are to follow the example of Jesus then we must be keenly aware that every person is formed in the image and likeness of God. Every person must be treated with deep reverence and respect, for we are all sons and daughters of the one God in whose sacredness we share. God intends that we live in harmony, that we practice a love that unites us and reflects our fundamental equality as human beings. Racism is a serious offense against God precisely because it violates the innate dignity of the human person. At its core, racism is a failure to love our neighbor. Since we cannot claim to love God unless we love our neighbor, we can only be one with God if we reject racism or work aggressively to remove it from our personal lives, our church, and our society. Pope John Paul II, in an important teaching document entitled Ecclesia in America, reminds us, every offense against the dignity of the person is an offense against God himself, in whose image human beings are made. This dignity is common to all without exception, since all have been created in the image of God. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Jesus answered to the question, Who is my neighbor? Luke chapter 10, verse 29, demands of each individual an attitude of respect for the dignity of others and of real concern for them, even if they are strangers. Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 37. Link in the script. Just about to say, Link is in the script, but that's actually false. Uh, responding to the sin of racism must begin with each of us examining our own selves on the subject. We need to be open to a change of heart. We should ask God's Spirit to remove from us all traces of racial prejudice. We should avoid racial stereotypes, slurs, and jokes. We should correct any expressions or racist attitudes among family members, friends, and co-workers. And that is the command. We should correct any expressions or racist attitudes among family members, friends, and co-workers. So, for example, if you have family members who claim to be Christians but like make racist jokes or whatever, you have to correct them because they are failing night and day. 
and we are purposely in rebellion against God either way. Again, and if you do not correct them, then you are apathetic to evil, either complacent or complicit. God will not count that guiltless, because silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not count guiltless. To not speak is to speak. To not act is to act. And that's by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And that's pretty much on point. We should seek opportunities to know and learn from people of other races. Resisting racism also means examining our basic instincts and assumptions about race. How do these assumptions shape our daily lives? What are our fears about people of other races? Link in the description, by the way. So again, in regards to correcting, when the person being corrected, uh, shout outs, that this isn't love. Again, and when they ask and say that you are dividing them, or the division, the reality, again, their hatred is already separation from God. They are already separated. They are already divided from God. They are not as a body, and this is the point. They put the Lord's name in vain. They do not love their neighbor. They are not of love, so they are not of God. They are divided. And they are fallen, quite so. And you have to work towards their salvation, which is why correction is necessary. Without hesitation. In chapter 32, The Image of Christ, in Dietrich Bonhoeffer's The Cost of Discipleship, Dietrich Bonhoeffer describes the fine image of God as, When the world began, Christ, God created Adam in his own image, as the climax of his creation, he wanted to have the joy of beholding in Adam the reflection of himself. And behold, it was very good. God saw himself in Adam here from the beginning. This mysterious paradox of man, he is a creature, and yet he is destined to be like his creator. Created man is destined to bear the image of the uncreated God. Adam is a God. His destiny is to bear this mystery in gratitude and obedience towards his maker. But the false serpents persuaded Adam that he must still do something to become like God. He must achieve the likeness by deciding and acting for himself. Through this choice, Adam rejected the grace of God, choosing his own action. He wanted instead to unravel the mystery of his being for himself, to make himself what God had already made him. That was the fall of man. Adam became as God, secretus, in his own way. But now he had made himself God, he no longer had a God. He ruled in solitude as a creator God in a God-forsaken, subjected world. But the riddle of human nature was still unresolved. With the loss of the godlike nature God had given him, man had forfeited the destiny of his being, which was to be like God. In short, man had ceased to be a man. He must live without the ability to live. Herein lies the paradox of human nature and the source of all our woe. Since that day, the sons of Adam in their pride have have strived to recover the divine image by their own efforts. The more serious and devoted their attempt to regain the lost image, and the more proud and convincing their apparent success, the greater their contradiction to God. Their misshapen form, modeled after the God they had invented for themselves, grows more and more like the image of Satan, though they are unaware of it. The divine image, which God in his grace has given to man, is lost forever on this earth. But God does not neglect his lost creature. He plans to recreate his image in man to recover his first light in his handiwork. He is seeking in his own image so that he may love it. But there is only one way to achieve this purpose, and that is for God, out of sheer mercy, to assume the image and form of fallen man. As man can no longer be the image of God, God must become like the image of man. But this restoration of the divine image concerns not just a part, but the whole human nature. It is not enough for a man simply to recover write ideas about God, or to obey his will in an isolated actions of his life. No, man must re be refashioned as a living whole in the image of God. His whole form, body, soul, and spirit must once more bear that image on earth. Such is God's purpose and destiny for man. His good pleasure can rest only with on his perfected image. 
An image needs a living object. A copy can only be formed from a model. Either a man models himself on the God of his own Im invention, or the true and living God molds the human form into his image. There must be a complete transformation, a metamorphosis. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. 2 Corinthians 3.18. If man is to be restored in the image of God, how then is that transformation to be effected? Since fallen man cannot rediscover and simulate the form of God, the only way is for God to take the form of man and come after, come to him. The Son of God, who dwells in the form of God the Father, lays aside that form and comes to man in the form of a slave. Philippians 25. The change of form, which could not take place in man, now takes place in God, the divine image, which has existed from eternity with God, assumes the image of the fallen sinful man. God sent his Son to be elected as the sinful flesh. Romans chapter 8, verse 2. God sends his son here lies the only remedy. It is not enough to give man a new philosophy or a better religion. A man comes to man. Every man bears an image. His body and his life becomes visible. A man is not a bare word, a thought, or a will. He is above all and always a man, a form, an image, a brother. And thus he does not create around him just a new way of thought, will, and action, but he gives us the new image, the new form. Now, in Jesus Christ, this is just what happened. The image of God has in our midst in the form of our fallen life, in the likeness of sinful flesh, in the teaching and acts of Christ, in his life and death, the image of God is revealed, and his divine image has been recreated on earth. Christ took upon this human form of ours. He became man even as we are man. In his humanity and his lowliness, we recognize our own form. He has become like a man so that men should be like him. And in the incarnation, the holy human race recovers the dignity of the image of God. Henceforth, any attack, even on the least of men, is an attack on Christ, who took on the form of man, and his own person restored the image of God in all that bears a human form. Through fellowship and communion with the incarnate Lord, we recover our true humanity, and at the same time, we are delivered from the individualism, which is the consequence of sin, and retrieve our solidarity with the whole human race. By being partakers of Christ incarnate, we are partakers of the whole humanity which he bore. Now we know that we have been taken up and born in the humanity of Jesus, and therefore that new nature we now enjoy means that we too must bear the sins and sorrows of others. The incarnate Lord makes his followers the brothers of all mankind. The philosophy of God, Titus 3, 4, revealed in the incarnation is the ground of Christian love towards all on earth that bears the name and image of man. The form of Christ incarnate makes the church into the body of Christ. All the sorrows of mankind fall upon that form, and only through that form can they be born. Link in the description, by the way. Again, racism, as with xenophobia, is a moral sin and a sin against God, let alone those who are racist and xenophobic are in direct opposition to God and in open rebellion against God. They aren't Christians officially or otherwise, and I do from this as a legal ordained reverend. We, we are called to be of love since God is love, 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. For racism, xenophobia, goes against the Majesty. day. Christ took our form, and in our form he redeemed man, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer states. Any attack, even on the least of man, is an attack on Christ, of whom in his person restored the image of God in all that bare human form. Paraphrasing. So, looking at the Buffalo shooter from a from a church doctrinal perspective, exorcist perspective, he gave in to demonic suggestion and acted on the temptations and harmed others. He was indoctrinated by fear-mongering, hate-mongering, which again, according to Father Gabriel Amara, what we watch, read, and listen to, that we become. We are transformed into what we read, watch, and listen to. So if you listen to hate-mongering, you become a being of hatred dominated by the spirit of hate and spirit of anger. How about a psychological perspective? The shooter was indoctrinated, radicalized by racist right-wing extremism. He believed in the white replacement theory touted by some politicians, preachers, teachers, and TV personalities like Tucker Carlson, for example, who's, who because of his hatred, well, hatred separation from God, so he is definitely not going to go to heaven either way. But here, regardless, he as a Christian should definitely pray that God corrects him. So he can repent, be redeemed. And it's certainly a town. And this is the point. Because again, we Christians have to work towards other salvation. 
And that's the point. So, because every human, every person, every being, is born in the image of Christ. So every single person is a child of Christ, by default, irregardless if they are a believer or not. So fallen or not, every human is your family. And again, what we say, what we do matters. And again, we have to work towards other salvation. Especially those who are so consumed by and dominated by the spirit of anger and the spirit of hate. Again, when according to that demonization, we Christians have to help them and save them from themselves as necessary. And again, the shooter was indoctrinated by radicalization by right wing. Extremism, racism, he believed in the right replacement theory, tabbed by some politicians, preachers, teachers, and other TV personalities, all of whom should be held legally accountable. Those who are ecclesiastical, who preach hatred, should be excommunicated without exception. They are not a Christians for failing matches day. I do affirm this as a legally ordained reverend. They are completely fallen and to be held legally accountable as well. Until they repent and attend, but still held legally accountable. Because at the end of the day, they still made the conscious decision. And they are in control. Concerning racism in a psychological perspective, I reminded of a psychology article. Here are some excerpts from the article, Charlottesville, Racism Has Effects on Mental Illness, Mental Health. What is a mental illness from psychology today? The case can be met that those who harbor racist beliefs are in fact exhibiting mental health problems beginning with self-centeredness and lack of empathy and continuing to anxiety and paranoia about other racial groups and culminating in hatred, hostility, and sociopathy. This implies that mental health-based programs, including psychoeducation, benign and productive relational contact between races, exposure, treatment of racial anxiety and perceptions of personal security and vulnerability, and the cultivation of compassion and empathy can be helpful in undercutting the elements of racism still existing in society, this should be, of course, be combined with a political and social program for making clear that racial hostility and bias are unacceptable at any level of society. I think racism is best seen as an outgrowth of self centeredness It leads to fear, anxiety, and paranoia about other racial groups, cognitive and emotional difficulties in processing interactions with other races, hostility and hostile actions towards other racial groups, and evaluation of racial groups based on incorrect assumptions superior to one's own racial group. People can develop complexes about race, meaning a set of automatic emotions, though, thoughts and behaviors, triggered when encountering another racial group, which tend to shut down openness, friendliness, and flexibility. In the American context, I'm speaking specifically of white supremacy and white majority racism against racial minorities. The racist believes that their group is superior to others and therefore devalues other groups. Since racial superiority has been done through a thorough flea and science student, Jay Gould's Mismeasure of a Man, for example, updated, re me the controversy of that book. See comments. Still, the point stands. Belief in racial superiority is factually incorrect. Any differences between races are properly seen as cultural acts. Our differences are primary, darker, and rooted in profound, different environments and opportunities individuals can experience. But when some individuals feel insecure or threatened, they need to claim superiority and power in order to feel better about themselves and thus latch on those beliefs of superiority. So racist beliefs can be a response to one's own security and ignorance about other racial groups in our common biological heritage. We all have some level of insecurity, misunderstanding, anxiety, and sometimes mistrust of other human beings. At some point or another, we all worry about acceptance and belonging and whether another person or group has positive, negative, or neutral intentions towards us. Until we are either reassured by our interactions or through previous interactions and understandings, have developed our own sense of safety and security, we might have a level of ignorance about others and anxiety. When we feel vulnerable, our fear and mistrust of others arises. So racist beliefs and actions can spring from a pathological level of anxiety or paranoia by racial groups. They could also rebound from perceptions of rejection by other groups. Self-centeredness results in cognitive, emotional, and relational deficits. Relationally, self-centeredness devalues others. Emotionally, self-centeredness involves a lack of empathy for others and as a result in hostility, in extreme case, the lack of empathy underlies 
sociopathic behavior caused by actual harm to others. On a more subtle level, empathic failure underlies nearly all our wounds of racism, sexism, homophobia, and so forth. Self-centeredness, anxiety, and paranoia give rise to cognitive distortions. The individual with the racist beliefs interprets the world in such a way as to support their ideology and thus their own secure self. The insecure self might feel more powerful to be united with others who share similar beliefs and reinforcing and radicalizing spiral, spiral of groupthink. Moreover, individuals who are suffering from personality disorders, psychosis, mood disorders, or cognitive dysfunction can accept racist beliefs or behaviors as a consequence of these cognitive, emotional, and relational problems. Of course, most people with mental health issues do not exhibit racism as a product of their illness. Receiving racism does result in mental health issues, as noted above. <coughs> in all these ways, we see how racism is a symptom of an underlying mental health issue and a mental health issue in itself. Dr. Carbo analyzed these issues in several sem seminal articles, a few of which are referenced below. In addition, Dr. Bells and Dunbar proposed criteria for pathological bias, which are appended below, personality disorders such as narcissism, antisocial personality, as well as other mental health um, conditions, my result in racist beliefs and actions. Some have wondered whether classifying racism as a mental health issue might allow violent perpetrators to plead not guilty by reason of insanity. This is a possibility, but this would also require them to identify as racist, and therefore they should be subject to corrective treatments. That's by Dr. Ravi Chandra. D and link is description, by the way. Psychology is the study of the human mind and its functions. Psychology is also useful in understanding humanity, especially our human nature, which again is intrinsically evil. We humans are creatures of habit, so there isn't an, a blue moon or a one-time incident. Concerning actions and words, there are patterns. Narcissism is a perfect, unadulterated representation of human nature. So, racism, xenophobia, again are antichrist since God is love from a doctoral standpoint. Both are a moral sin and against God regardless since racism, xenophobia, directly takes the Lord's name in vain by denying in God's image, imagine this day, hatred is separation from God, separation from God is spiritual death, which is Lucifer's aim, he can't win a conventional war against God, so he'll try to take as many souls with him, through conversion to him, or destroying those he can't enthrall. So again, from a psychological perspective, antisocial personality disorders, psychosis, psychopathy, sociopathy, delusion, and narcissism can be linked to racism, if not racist, beliefs, as well as numerous other mental health causes. However, racism is taught and learned, so it is a societal, cultural issue as well. At the end of the day, racism is part of human nature, which is intrinsically evil. As irrevocably proven, Lucifer uses those hatred and hearts to unspeakable evils, and he uses them abundantly. So answering hatred with equal measure will only allow evil to beget evil. We have seen this play out in Ukraine for months. As Christians, we are commanded to die to our human nature daily, to conquer it through Christ, since we cannot do it. Defeated on our own. We have to repent, to desire, to change, to take the steps to change and change for the better. One of my friends from my college years, who is a church elder in Indiana and hosts an online community based on change through con conversation, reasoning, and love, Payer Universe, yeah, shout out there by the way, posted a meme they made that said, I don't care how much oil you slap on people and pray. Until they want to change, they'll be just be a greasy demon. His point was concerning prayers for change, exorcism from those pastors that don't actually fully follow the actual law, protocols of their Roman rites. There are instances, which you hear in the news articles, where the person that tried to perform an exorcism fails badly because they believe in their own power as opposed to being fully used by God and understanding that they don't actually have any power of their own as a human whatsoever, and they get beat up and worse. My friend's point being that people won't change unless they want to. <coughs> I have stated my good friend has a point, so a shout out to his online community and preaching. Considering I do consecration a lot more these days and don't mess with major exorcism, not that I don't keep caps on people's nature and if the Holy Spirit isn't in them, then what exactly it is, excluding mental health issues. But as stated in my serm last sermon concerning people being creatures of habit, when our sins become a daily habit, that is why the desire to change from the person themselves is necessary outside of when a major exorcism is deemed absolutely necessary. And recently enough, as in some weeks ago actually at this point, 
uh, on my day job, they rehired a troublesome person who's a diagnosed narcissist. He belittles, demeans, and does so much more. So suffice it to say, first day I was there, I pretty much ignored it, did nothing. And after that, I was like, going, no more. So, so of course I uh, wore my vial of blessed anointing oil on that second day. Brought my concentration book and my major exorcism book. And that second day, I did warn that person that if they started harming others, I would give three. I start giving three warnings that, but after they, they hit that certain mark, then I would start doing what I needed to do, because my second hat goes now on. I don't actually like to cross my worlds between being actress, between being ordained, priest and everything, as opposed to my actual day job, which is less than a thousand times less than that. But the point is, as I will if I deem it necessary, because I have to protect others. Because, again, I took that Hippocratic up, and I have to follow that vow to the end of my days. Now, if you learn about vows in the last sermon that I did, so suffice it to say, of course, that first day, I actually I didn't do the prayers of protection, which I first needed to do. <laughs> so when I actually started doing the concentration, deliverance, uh, suffice it to say, uh, everything that could go wrong did, but it happened to pretty much everyone, but the majority of it happened to that said person, and of course that happened after the second regimen. So, correcting my mistake there, so for that rest of the week, I did consecration regimens. So on the second consecration regimen, of course, I mean, actually did prayers of protection before I started, of course. And so if I just say, all everything that would happen bad, that did happen bad, happened only specifically to that person. And then every single day they explained how toxic the environment was to them. And they're very, pretty much incredibly sick that entirety. And that trip, and they ended up trying to leave every single day super early, not like they didn't do that in the past, of course, past time that they were hired, but they did it much far too soon. And at the end of the week, I ended up doing the full consecration, and I ended up blessing the building, and that person ended up, uh, outside of about two days, which I actually wasn't there. Of course, my work schedules from that point on, though, he never returned. I never worked on every single day that I was there, so considering I'm like there the majority of the week anyways. You know, it's because the thing that was inside him was having an aversion to the holy, into God's presence. And and that well, if I serve to say the spirit took him with it and left. The consecrated the building. So that was like my first uh, successful consecration. I actually had to confer with a pastor I know with experience in exorcism concerning all the steps that I actually did take. And at the end of the day, I was correct in doing what I had to do. And I was quite justified in doing what I had to do because I have to protect others, even spiritually. Because those around me are my flock, pretty much. So those around me are under spiritual protection, as much as I can do, as needed. And this is the point I actually didn't actually do a major exorcism, but I did do a concentration. So I did the whole week, and then and then the main set, of course, including anointing the building. And God and his angels driving the spirits out. But at the end of the day, I myself don't have any power. And I myself didn't have any say, and I didn't know what was actually going to happen. But I did follow the training, outside of that one group on the first day. 
and I got to observe what happened afterwards. So, and this is the point. I don't mess with major exorcism. There's no way I want to. But if I have to do a consecration of a building, if I have to observe people and find out what's inside them, if they're vexed, if they're Christian men in hunger of Christ, if they profess to be of Christ and they harm others, as I said, if I have to make the decision on that person, I have to defend people from them. Which means the person thing is, is I'm a doer, not a hearer only. So I have to do action, I have to do just action. In accordance to laws, God's law and Japan's law, so state and federal. And the Hippocratic Oath means, again, I have to safeguard and protect others. So, and of course, this is exactly what I did. So, this is like my first actual successful consecration. That person hasn't been there for a week, half, about two weeks now, so it's fired at this point. And this is the point is, I don't mess around when I have to do stuff like this. I really don't. So, for example, if you have to deal with a Christian who professes to be a Christ, but isn't, especially with their belittling, harming others, threats of violence towards others, again. So, if I have to deal with stuff like that, the thought of exorcism will come to mind, because I have to drive whatever is inside of them out to try to save them, especially from themselves. It's the same difference as when I have to give people to God for correction, because, again, when it comes to all that stuff, I have no say what, what happens. And I can't interfere, and I can't intervene in the face. But again, I have a duty to do. And so, when it comes down to the consecration, I got to see all this stuff happening within minutes or after all these prayers, the specific prayers, with a specific intent, helping, healing, fixing, and or removing. Again, I do not have power whatsoever, but God does. And it's a reliance on God to fight that battle. With prayer, but with just action. Again, you cannot harm others. You cannot fight evil with evil. You can only fight evil with good. I do sacraments, sacramentals as needed, or when called upon, but I stick to minor exorcisms at the very most, and adhere to the law's protocols to the letter, and understanding in no uncertain terms, I myself have no power, but truly rely on God when I invoke and pray. Saying that, I do keep an eye on those who do who not only have the Holy Spirit in them as Christians. I will pray for healing, change for them, for their salvation, which we have to work towards the salvations of others. Or, if they are harming others, I may pray that God singles them out for correction. With the prayers which I consider as a last resort, again, I can interfere and intervene in what has to happen. Again, if I really want to see the signs of demonization outside of the occult, then I'd follow protocols for such. I'd look directly at the source of hatred, who and why. Given cause and effect, we see the effect of people verbally harming others or otherwise, and finding the root cause of it, of course, is rather simple, given psychology and human nature. Again, when it comes to racism, xenophobia, I look at it as a mental health illness concerning personality disorder, symptoms of delusion, psychosis, psychopathy, sociopathy, fallenness, the Holy Spirit is no longer in them, or the possible partial possession or a combination of all three. With narcissism, it is a diagnosed personality disorder on the DSM-5, but with a self-centeredness and the belief that they can do all that they wish, especially to others, again, mental illness, fallenness, or a combination of both. However, when it comes down to it, sin nature is part of humanity, thanks to our fall, in which Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners, we would be saved. But we have to change, of course. People can change, but it takes time. Sometimes they are forced to change due to the combination of legal accountability, which is why accountability is love, or the law of consequences being enacted on them to make them decide to change. 
I myself fell on my Christian walk, thanks to the cheap grace and the false doctrine once saved all I saved nearly a decade ago. God had to use an event, create an event in my life, which caused a great deal of pain, but I was able to see what I had become. I atoned certainly, and I repented from it, and was able to change and follow the path God called me to, which several years later, I became a legally ordained reverend. This is why I can have such compassion on fallen Christians, beings of hatred. I had fallen in my walk with Christ. I was blind, but now I see. I repented and changed. Everyone can change, and we Christians are to be proponents of change, changing the world through our action and our words. If you are a Christian, believe people can't change, you are directly placing the Lord's name in vain by denying Jesus' ability to save. Everyone can be redeemed. Everyone can change. It is never too late to change. This is the main point of why I admonish. I pray for change for others. Certainly request God to single people out for correction as absolutely necessary, as well as legal accountability if deemed necessary for the person will get the help they desperately need while atoning for what they've done. I condemn actions, but not the persons, because people can change. I talk about repentance all the time, but why is repentance change? According to God Question or dot org's article, is repentance a change of mind or a turning from sin? Why is repentance change? Technically, repentance is a change of mind, not a turning from sin. The Greek word translated repentance is Metonia, and meaning is simply a change of mind. In common usage, however, we often speak of repentance as a turning from sin. There is a good reason for this. Repentance is often associated with salvation in Scripture. What happens when the Holy Spirit begins His work to being a person of salvation? The Spirit gives the sinner a personal understanding and infallible conviction that the facts concerning His Spirit spiritual state are true. Those facts of His personal sin, the eternal punishment due Him for His sin, substantially a substitutionary nature of Jesus' suffering for a sin and the need of faith in Jesus to save him from sin. From that convicting work of the Holy Spirit, John 16, 8, the sinner repents, changes his mind about sin, the Savior, salvation. When a repentant person changes his mind about sin, that change of mind naturally leads to returning from sin. Sin is no longer desirable or fun because sin brings condemnation. The repentant sinner begins to for his past misdeeds, and he begins to seek ways to amend his behavior. Luke chapter 19, verse 8. So ultimately, the result of the change of mind about sin is good deeds. The sinner turns away from sin towards faith in the Savior, and that faith is shown in action. See James 2, 17. The change of mind repentance is not precisely the same as the act of turning from sin and visible performance of good deeds, but one leads to the other. In this way, repentance is related to turning from sin. When people speak of repentance as a turning from sin rather than a change of mind, they are using a figure of speech called metonymim. In metonymim, the name and the concept is replaced with the word suggested by the original. Metonymim is a common everyday language. For example, news reports that begin, the White House issued a statement today, are using metonymim as the name of the building where the president lives is substantiated for the and substitute for the name of the president himself. In the Bible, we can see other examples of Matun. In Mark 9, 17, the father states that his son has a mute spirit. King James Version. The evil spirit itself is not mute. The evil spirit causes the boy to be mute. The spirit is named after the effect it produced a mute child. The Matun here replaces the cause of the effect similarly using the word repentance to mean a turning from sin replaces the cause of the effect. The cause is repentance, a change of mind. The effect is a turning away from sin. A word is replaced by a related concept. That's maintaining in summary, repentance is a change of mind. But the full biblical understanding of repentance goes beyond that. In relationship to salvation, repentance is a change of mind from an embrace of sin to rejection of sin and from rejection of Christ to a faith in Christ. Such repentance is something only God can enable. John 6, 44, Acts 11, 18, 2 Timothy 2, 25. Therefore, true biblical repentance will always result in a change of behavior, maybe not instantly, but inevitably and progressively. Link in description, by the way. So again, cause and effect concerning God's creation when looking at it from a metaphysical perspective. So the cause is we Christians have a change of mind, and the effect is turning away from sin. As Billy Graham has stated in his sermon, our minds were at enmity with God. 
Fallen Christians do not repent and don't believe they have to, thanks to the false doctrine once saved, always saved, and cheap grace, which is damnation to begin with, and can't until God does literally open their eyes. Paul had to deal with this on the road to Damascus. Again, up to 70% plus of American Christians are fallen, believing they can justify their sins, especially before and when they want to harm others they hate, believing they can hate others, and God allows the hate, which hatred is separation from God. God rejects them. Their worship is unreal as long as others have cause against them. while not repenting and further condemning themselves to Gehenna, while Lucifer uses those with hatred in their hearts to the unspeakable evils, instead of living the new life that Christ gave for them in a life of repentance and change. We have to repent on the daily. There is no exception. Those who claim otherwise, cheap grace and once saved, always saved adherents, are walking in darkness and are absolutely fallen until they truly repent. We have to forgive others of their transgressions, otherwise God won't forgive us of ours, and we have to love others both our neighbors, those around us, and our enemies, those who wish to do us harm, without exception. Speaking of enemies, outside those who are separated from God, beings of hatred, those dominated by hatred, who are our enemies? According to the Cost of, cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer highlights who the enemies of Christ, the Christian are and what to do concerning them. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 45. Here for the first time in the Sermon on the Mount, we meet the word which sums up the whole of this message, the word love. Love is defined in uncompromising terms as the love of our enemies. Had Jesus only told us to love our brethren, we might have understood what he had meant by love, but now he leaves us in no doubt whatever as to his meaning. The enemy was no mere abstraction for the disciples. They knew him only too well. They came across him every day. There were those who crushed them for undermining the faith and transgressing the law. There were those who hated them for leaving the, all they have they have for Jesus' sake. They were those who insulted and derided them for, being, for their weakness and humility. They were those who persecuted them as prospectively dangerous revolutionaries and sought to destroy them. Some of their enemies were numbered among the champions of the popular religion who resented the exclusive claim of Jesus. These latter enjoyed considerable power and reputation. To the natural man, the very notion of loving his enemies is an intolerable offense and quite beyond his capacity. It cuts right across the idea of good and evil. More importantly still to a man under the law, the idea of of loving his enemies is a clear contrary to the law of God, which requires men to sever all connection with their enemies and to pass judgment on them. Jesus, however, takes the law of God in his own hands and expounds on its true meaning. The will of God to which the law gives expression is that men should defeat their enemies by loving them. In the New Testament, our enemies are those who harbor hostility against us, not those against whom we cherish hostility, for Jesus refuses to reckon with such a possibility. The Christian must treat his enemy as a brother and quiet his hostility with love. His behavior must be determined not by the way others treat him, but by the treatment he himself receives from Jesus. It has only one source, and that is the will of Jesus. Love your enemies. The preceding commandment has spoken only of the passive endurance of evil. Here Jesus goes further and advises us not only to hear with the evil and the evil person patiently, but only to refrain from treating him as he treats us, but actively to engage in heart love towards him. We are to serve our enemy in all things without hypocrisy and utter sincerity. No sacrifice which a lover would make for his beloved is too great for us to make for our enemy. If out of love, our brother, we are willing to sacrifice goods, honor, and life, we must be prepared to do the same for our enemy. We are not to imagine that this is to condone his evil. Such love proceeds from strength rather than weakness from the truth rather than fear, and therefore it cannot be guilty of hatred of another. And who is to be the object of such love, if not those whose hearts are stifled with hatred? <clears throat> Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. This is the supreme command. Through the medium of prayer, we go to our enemy, stand by his side, and plead to him, to God. Jesus does not promise that when we bless our enemies and do good for them, they will not despitefully use and persecute us. They certainly will. But not even that can hurt or overcome us so long as we pray for them. 
For if we pray for them, we are taking their distress and poverty, their guilt and perdition upon ourselves, and pleading to God for them, we are doing vicariously for them what they cannot do for themselves. Every insult they utter only serves to bind us more closely to God and them. Their persecution of us only serves to bring them nearer to reconciliation with God and to further the triumphs of love. Link in the description, by the way. This is the point. We as Christians have to love others, especially those who wish to harm us. We have to pray for others, intercede for others. Prayer is love for his intercession between Jesus, our mediator, and God. And help others, everyone around us that needs help, especially the poor and the infirm. There are Christians, well, fallen Christians, so full of hatred and who teach and preach hatred and certainly help inspire actions such as the Buffalo Shooter or what we are witnessing on the ongoing war in Ukraine, the Russian Orthodox blood into our ideology, which is so full of hatred. They're blessing the war which makes them complicit evil and being partakers of hatred. They are separated from God. If I truly want to look at sources of demonization, again, all I have to do is look directly at the localized source of hatred, who and why. As Father Gabriel Amra says, as the Catechism states, we cannot be united with God unless we freely choose to love him. We cannot love God if we sin gravely against him and against our neighbor or against ourselves. Link description, by the way. Let's take a look at recent events concerning the fallen Christian pastor that is Greg Locke, who am I for him is in the cr of Christ. His hatred separates him from Christ, 2 Peter chapter 2 directly applies to Christians such as him. According to the article, Witch Hunting Pastor faces calls for IRS review and wake a pulpit rant against Democrats, but, the ten but when Tennessee Pastor Greg Locke attacked Democrats from his church stage, one religious freedom group says he crossed the line. If you vote Democrat, I don't ever want you around this church, the Witch Hunting Pastor told the crowd of Global Vision Bible Church earlier this month. You can get out. You can get out, you demon. You can get out, you baby-butchering election thief. Yeah, I love that idolatry, by the way. Mm. I know. He is self-condemned again, unfortunately. So you need to pray for Christians such as them. These fallen Christians, anyway. They aren't of Christ. Excommunication is warranted, by the way. You cannot be a Christian and vote Democrat in this country. I don't care how mad that makes you. You can get pissed off as you want to. You cannot be a Christian, but a Democrat of the He moved on to attack President Joe Biden, citing language often used by former President Donald Trump, his idol. Locke then attacked former President Barack Obama, claiming he is behind all America's problems. So that's scapegoating. I know. So, again, looking at it from both a psychology level and, again, from an exorcist perspective and church doctrine. Again, outside of being first... Again, Second Peter chapter two applies directly to him, and so many others concerning false prophets and concerning those who are bound to Ghana because of their hatred, the hatred of separation with God, and that idolatry. Again, it's important to pray for those who fall from Christ. It's very important to work towards their salvation and save them from themselves as needed. He went on to speculate that the Buffalo shooting had nothing to do with race despite the shooter's manifesto being clear on the topic. Finally, he warned his parishioners about demons and witchcraft. Now, a letter written to the IRS by Americans United for the Separation of Church and State says that Locke also clearly told his Congress to vote against the Democrats from the pulpit of the church, which they said violates the law and we ask for an investigation into Locke's conduct under 26 U.S.C. and 7611. The law makes it clear that it that no nonprofit that is tax exempt can directly or indirectly participate in or intervene in, including the publishing or distributing of statements, any political campaign on behalf of or in opposition to any candidate for a public office. Locke is no stranger to this controversy, and last year he claimed that an anointing oil can cure psychological disorders and has ordered his church to not wear masks or get vaccinated against COVID 19. He was banned from Twitter in February that same month. He held a literal book burning. Link in the description, by the way. Such maliciousness and malevolence, not to mention that particular idolatry, Trumpism. His negligence concerning safeguarding life is another, is absolutely fallen, and he is absolutely fallen because of that hatred. His treating of his perceived enemies as less than human is again fallenness. His allegiance to political movements, 
over God makes him morally devoted. So again, so against God, since a Christian cannot serve two masters, preachers and Christians in general with such maliciousness and malevolence have to be excommunicated without exception. They are not of Christ, for they are not of love, because God is love. Even a major exorcism would be necessary concerning removing the spirit of hate and spirit of anger from them, delivering them, returning them to Christ, and after they repent to salvation, since we have to work towards the salvation of others, especially through intercession and right action, peaceful, nonviolent, and legal accountability as necessary. Again, the victims of the hatred from fallen Christians are justified to throw them to the courts. This is why, again, in Matthew, Jesus talks about us reconciling ourselves with our accusers, otherwise they will throw, be thrown to the courts and won't get out until the last penny is paid. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brothers will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift to the altar, then may I remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court. Thus your accuser hand you over to the judge that there's the card, and you'll be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you'll never get out until you have paid the last penny. Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26. Again, when you harm others, you need to both repent and atone. Otherwise, you are leaving yourself open to law of consequences, not to mention grieving the Holy Spirit. You can do things, in fact, that no longer make you of Christ. Pastor Locke is now having to deal with being thrown to the courts, given what he did, and again, there is no excuse for what he did. And according to doctrine, there is an excuse for hatred. When it comes to the final judgment, a Christian cannot be of hatred and be of Christ simultaneously. You give Jesus the lie. You cannot mix the bad with the good and not have corruption, fallenness, and subsequent spiritual peril. Here are several verses that are the outline of the path of a Christian, Christ's tenets, and testaments, which we have to follow to the letter. The fruit of the Spirit. Those who don't exemplify the fruits of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit isn't in them. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. So enmity is hatred. I warned you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is in law, and those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, we must also keep in step with the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 25, in the Sinai's version. And the new line, the life of the Christian. Now this I say and testify to the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are dark in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves in, up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity, but that is not the way you learn, Christ. Assuming you have heard about him and were taught him that the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good as building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 32, in the Standard Version. The Mark of a Christian. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another, brotherly affection, as do one another, is showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in help, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints, and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. 
Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is good, honorable in sight of all. If possible, so far it depends on you. Live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Believe it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing so you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome evil by you, but overcome evil with good. That's Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Inside that's written. Majesty in God's image. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this love that God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us, sin, sin, and be the preparation for our sins. Beloved, the gospel love of y'all sought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfecting us. By this we know that we abide in him in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. We have come to know and to believe that the love God has for us. God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this love is perfected in us, so that we have come confident of the day of final judgment, because as he is so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do his punishment, and whoever has fears has been not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. That's First John chapter 4, verses 7 to 21, means stand as virgin. Ministering to others, helping others, treating others well. When the Son of Man comes to his glory and all the angels with him, when he will sit on his glorious throne, before him will he gather all the nations and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. And he will place his sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. For I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we... S- See you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink. And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to the least of these of my brothers, you did it to me. Then he said to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food, I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And then when they also answered, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick in prison? It did not minister to you. And you will answer them again, Truly I say to you, as you did not do to do one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into your eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Matthew chapter 5, 25, verses 31 through 46. An exorcist explains the amount of the answer Satan's falling army of fallen angels, Father Gabriel Amorath goes deeply into specific verses as specified above. The essential question is, what is the concrete rapport that each man has with God? As I have mentioned, the solemn response is found in the Gospel of Matthew, the saved and the damned will be chosen on the basis of their recognition or rejection of Christ in the infirm, in the hungry, and in the poor. Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. Two essential elements emerge from this. The first division is schism between those going to paradise and those going to hell, between the saved and the condemned. The second regards the manner in which this judgment will be accomplished with love. God's commandments and every other precept are summarized solely in one commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. John 15, 12. We can easily understand that this commandment is addressed to each human conscious in every age, including those who lived before Christ and those who today as in centuries past, never heard anyone speak of the Son of Man. Therefore, the final finale is this stupendous passage. It's a beautiful passage from Matthew. Truly I say to you, as you did to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Matthew chapter 25, verse 40. If each man, apart from his religion, his culture, his epoch, and any other circumstance, has loved his neighbor, he has also loved the Lord Jesus in person. 
any rapport to our brothers and sisters in any locality, any age, or any situation. All in all, a rapport with Jesus in person. Each human creature who achieves fulfillment in his human relationships is, at the same time, relating to God. For this reason, the love of the neighbor is a fundamental precept of life. John the Evangelist helps us to understand that we cannot say that we love God, whom we cannot see, if we do not love our brother, whom we can see. 1 John 4.20 The love that will judge us will be the same love that we have or have not practiced towards others, the same love that Jesus lived in his earthly experience and taught us in the Gospels, the same love to which we are entitled through the sacraments, through prayer, and through the life of faith. The ability to love comes from grace, and it is much reduced in those who do not know Christ, and even more so in those who know him but do not follow him, so the fallen Christians, as I state. A choice that assumes a serious sin. Indeed, Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Mark 16.16 16. On the other hand, in announcing the extraordinary jubilee of mercy, Pope Francis reminds us that the other fundamental aspect of the question is that the love which we shall be judged will be the love of mercy. Mercy is the ultimate and supreme act by which God comes to meet us. This mercy, he says, is a bridge that connects God and the other man and opens our hearts to the hope of being loved forever despite all sinfulness. God's compassionate glance and his desire to live in total communion with us opens our hearts to the hope that each sin and each failure inflicted on man by his great enemy, Satan, will be looked upon with the eyes of a loving and accepting father. Therefore, let us live full of hope because we know that even in the difficulties of our life's journeys, God will wipe away all the tears from our eyes. On that day, death shall be no more, neither shall be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, or any more, for the former things have passed away. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. Hmm. Sorry about that. Link in the description, by the way. Again, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer has stated, Things are much simpler than we'd like. It's not that we do not know God's commandments, it's that we simply choose not to do them, and as a subsequent consequence, we no longer know what is right, and that is our predicament. Paraphrasing, of course. The command is simple. Love others, help others, safeguard, cherish life, intercede for others, and save others, especially Christians who fell and are separated from God due to their own hatred. Again, hatred is a heart sin and a terrible offense to God. Racism, xenophobia is a moral sin and one that places the soul at very great risk because as long as people have cause against you, your worship to God is unreal and you create your barriers between yourself and God, separating yourself from God, which is spiritual death, and thus Lucifer's aim. The Buffalo Mass shooter was conceived by hatred and dominated by the spirit of hatred and did the deed that Lucifer designed for him all because of hatred. My heart goes out to the victims' families of that shooting. The most recent mass shooting in Texas as of May 24th it's another occurrence of someone being dominated spiritually and enacting their desires. My heart grieves for the families who've lost their children in this most recent senseless act. Again, Lucifer uses those with hatred in their hearts to do unspeakable evils. This is why you have to guard your heart. Do not let bitterness and hatred in and to denounce hatred and wrong. In regard to gun violence, as stated previously, concerning being what it means to be truly pro-life, a Christian should be against gun violence and pro-common sense gun laws, something I have to advocate being safeguarding lives, souls, and cherishing life. So universal background checks require registration, licensing, and waiting periods, banned gun purchases by those with an officially diagnosed mental illness, limit one gun purchase per year, ban concealed carry without permits, also ban sales and the legal ability to obtain weapons from people who post threats of violence or otherwise, vague or otherwise, online concerning people, schools, hatred, etc. We should create more laws with legal accountability concerning giving the state and federal governments more investigation ability, power, concerning investigating online threats of violence, etc. Or when people say in social media, such as the Texas shooter and the Buffalo shooter, their plans to murder others, so the government will have the power to take their weapons away and print an atrocity, and yes, other governments across the world have similar laws, incidentally. That's a good starting point. When it comes to other theologians' opinions on gun violence, Reverend Shane Claiborne comes to mind. In a recent post on Instagram, he stated, I'm tired of politicians and preachers offering thoughts and prayers after every mass shooting while simultaneously refusing to take the necessary actions to end gun violence. This is what it means to take the Lord's name in vain. 
there is something deeply hypocritical about paying, praying for a problem that you are unwilling to resolve. And that's by uh, Miroslav Volt. And again, and again, the quote is: "There is something deeply hypocritical about praying for a problem that you are unwilling to resolve." We'll get about this a little bit later, of course. Another theologian I know, Dr. Esau Macaulay, PhD, spoke about recent events. In his social media post, he stated, "Folks out here acting like the doctrine of the sinfulness of humanity is an argument against banning assault weapons." Let me log off for the day. So in Dr. Esau McCallie's post, his reference is the doctrine of sinfulness of humanity as an argument against banning assault weapons. Human nature is intrinsically evil. This is a fact. No matter the types of laws outlawing weapons, there are types of lost, fallen, castaway, fallen Christians especially, who will try and go around the banning and create or, or create worse weapons. We see this in the United Kingdom and Japan, for that matter, who ban guns, but people went to knives to harm and kill others. And, there's a, and you see this throughout the news and throughout the statistics, all these uh, assaults and murders by knife. And then we see all these uh, drives for the removal of knives and etc. So, so for no matter who banning guns, but people again might get knives together and kill no harm others. Again, human nature is intrinsically evil. But we as Christians have to try to counter it regardless, where we can't be apathetic to evil, complacent complicit to evil, God will not hold us guiltless of it and in, if this is the truth. Difficult at times and why so many Christians fell, but it is the truth and factual, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer has stated. Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold guiltless. To not speak is to speak. To not act is to act. Link to scripture, by the way. This is why I'm a doer of God's word, not a hearer only when it comes to actions as a Christian. I am a proponent of change. I cannot be apathetic to evil, nor can I turn a blind eye to the suffering of others in regards to the Good Samaritan proverb that Jesus spoke. We can't wait and see. Those Christians who say, God is in control, and give their thoughts and prayers, and then they themselves do nothing, they are apathetic to evil. In the end, given waiting and seeing is apathy to evil, complacency to evil at the least, if we see someone suffering, we have to help. If we do nothing, we are equally as guilty as the person that caused the harm, damage due to, to complacency to evil. Again, God will not hold us guiltless for waiting and seeing and staying on the sidelines when people are suffering around us. Which is why thoughts and prayers, those who do such things but do nothing, again, they are counted as equally guilty by God. This is why apathy to evil is very specific. My own personal opinion, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. A Christian should not be seeking or desiring harming others the lives of others, if you seek it, it will find you, certainly. Never a good end regardless. And with the types of demonic spirits Lucifer uses to tempt others, with temptations, demonic suggestions to harm others, again, we see all of this all the time and in the news when it comes to the results. As irrevocably proven, Lucifer, time and again, uses those with hatred in their hearts and anger in their hearts to the unspeakable evils. For me, it is a cause and effect relation. Those civilians who are it's my God-given right to own a weapon and call themselves a Christian are similar to the God's guns and Trump and the God's guns and Jesus types of Christians, Christian nationalists, QAnon, Trump supporters, and especially Christianists. Link in the description for that term, by the way. So all fallen Christians for several reasons, one of which is due to their own cultural beliefs, including idolatry, people given temptations. Another is a belief that they have a right to harm others, regardless of self-defense or not, so the belief that they can do all that they wish to others applies there. So again, following the application of the three principles of Satanism can be directly applied. Given the direct result of actions afterwards, so again, cause and effect. So fallen, again. Another belief is that tying guns to either Jesus or guns put the Lord's name in vain concerning 
We Christians are called to be peacemakers, to make peace by peacefulness. So going against Christ's tenets and testaments regardless. So again, fallen due to mixing the bad with the good. As Father Gramaramara says, when the order of values is jumbled and the bad is mixed with the good, individuals and groups pay heed solely to their own interests and not to those of others. Thus it happens that the world ceases to be a place of true brotherhood. Link in the description, by the way. Another is the fact that when people get so angry, they have a blinding rage and act swiftly on it, destroying things and harming others, and after the incident, not remembering what they did or what happened. Blind rage incidents are considered temporary possession, considering the spirit of anger. And again, why one of the seven deadly sins is wrath, and why we as Christians are called to let go of our anger wrath, for it always leads to harm of others. Another reason that as Christians, we are called to be peacemakers and to be not of this world or follow worldly devotion, since we only have one master, and that is God, since Jesus is Lord. Again, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer states, the followers of Christ have been called to peace, and they must not only have peace, but make it. To that end, they must renounce all violence or tumult. In the cause of Christ, nothing is to be gained by such methods. His disciples keep the peace by choosing to endure suffering themselves rather than inflict it on others. They maintain fellowship where others would break it off. They renounce hatred and wrong. In so doing, they overcome evil with good and establish the peace of God in the midst of a world of war and hate. As Jesus says, there is no alternative. Either we love God or we hate him. We are confronted by an either we love God or we love earthly goods. If we love God, we hate the world, and if we love the world, we hate God. It makes no difference whether that love be conscious and deliberate or not. In fact, it is morally certain that it is neither, and that our conscious and deliberate desire will be to serve two masters, to love God and the good things of life. We shall indignantly repudiate the suggestion that we hate God, and will be firmly convinced that we love him, whereas by trying to combine love for him and love with the world, we are turning our love for him into hatred. And then, when, and then we have lost a single eye, our heart is no longer in fellowship with Jesus. Our deliberate intentions make no difference to inevitable results. You cannot serve two masters if ye be followers of Christ Jesus. Link in the description, by the way. God has given us free will. Regardless, if we willfully choose to do good, be of love, and therefore be of God, or choose evil, let alone self-centeredness, narcissism, and the list goes on. Having the ability and using it wisely are two very different things. Choosing to do good and using the strengths given to us for the betterment of others is what it means to be a Christian, following the marks of a true Christian as the said example. You, as a Christian, have a choice, either or. You can't be in the middle of this either, that is lukewarm, which is similar to apathy to evil in that sense. So in regards to lukewarm, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. With that, you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. That's Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 through 16. And so a personal story, and it comes down to lukewarm. As I was growing up and I was, I was a very small child at this point, like six or seven, well, five to seven or so, anyways. Uh, me and my family lived on a hundred acre ranch in Oregon. And uh, outside of the local church of town, about 30 miles away. Yeah, I know. When, it's, when it calls down to living in the boonies, that's pretty much it. But, but, uh, Ever so often, we went uh, to a church uh, called the uh, Applegate uh, Christian Fellowship. It was in Ashland, Oregon, so that very, very, very artsy town in Oregon. Very beautiful, by the way. I've only been there about three, four, five, seven, uh, probably 15 times from that age of like four to whatever. And then, <coughs> and then once again, like about 12, I think. But, but when it came to, down to, I remember specifically about the sermon from that pastor there on the, on being lukewarm. Because if you are lukewarm, Jesus does not want you. Because you are, because when it comes to lukewarm, 
again, it's that corruption that makes him good with the bad. You have to be fully of him. You have to be with Christ. If you're not, you are against Christ. And this is the point, of course. Uh, when it came to the Applegate Christian Fellowship, all the sermons were, just the ones that my family went to were outside. And of course it is. That's pretty cool, by the way. Hmm. Yeah, I do actually remember up to a certain points in my life, but I had a very strong memory of that sermon, which in and of itself here we are today. Again, you as a Christian cannot be lukewarm because Christ will cast you out. So in regards to everything, repent daily when you do sin, atone and above all, make changes in your life that reflect the love of God within you and outside of you. As Jesus says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14.6 uh, Jesus is Lord. You have to follow his ways and make the changes in your life he desires by following all of his tenets and testaments and submitting to God's control in your life. Those who claim to be Christian and do not submit to God, they cannot resist the devil. And we see this with 70 plus percent of Christians here in America that are fallen and not of Christ due to failing Christ's tens and testaments and being dominated by their hatreds and anger and therefore dominated by the spirit of anger and hate and harming others if not trying to dominate others. Again, I as a legal ordained reverend affirm that these type of Christians aren't Christians officially or otherwise. You have to submit to God's will. And God's control of you. And this is the point. If I hadn't submitted, I certainly wouldn't be a ordained reverend right now. I certainly wouldn't be a preceptor either. So all this teaching, I refer to theology here. <laughs> and of course, then when you priest and have all these multitudes of honorary doctors either. But for the most part, again, I have to teach, preach, witness. And warn. And so I do what God can handle me, and I do minor exorcisms as well. Mm. But this is the point. God's in control. I don't know what's going to happen just when it comes to my own personal life. So it's probably the most adventurous time of my life, I'd like to say. It really is. So, not that I don't have cares and reality in the world, but I just see the best side. God wills of me, and which is, of course, helping others, safeguarding others, advocating, and holding to accountability, those and that in which need to be held to accountability. Because again, you as a Christian cannot harm others. You call yourselves of Christ. Hatred is separation from God. It is anathema to God. You create barriers between yourself and God when you hate others. And this is the truth. And if you choose to not do nothing when people are suffering, God is going to count you equally as guilty as a person who is causing the harm of others. So change. In conclusion, guard your heart. Do not let hate into it. But instead, be the beacon, example of love you want to see in the world. Forgive others of their transgressions, but hold to accountability those who harm others as necessary so that change can happen. Through legal accountability, the person in town gets the mental health help they desperately need. Get to know of God, repent, and change. Love others, your neighbors, and those around you, and especially your enemies, those who wish to do you harm, and give them the infinite love of Jesus no matter what they do. Be of peace and strive for peace by peaceful means. Exemplify the fruits of the Spirit in your daily life and be doers of the word, not hearers only. Make the world better through the love you give others. If by your actions alone a person questions your disbelief in God, you truly are of God. Again, your actions and your words matter, so never try to justify what you wish to do others. Justifying the sin beforehand, those who do such things, the Holy Spirit is in them, and they aren't Christians or of Christ. But instead, live humbly and treat others as you would treat yourself. Do not be of hatred, for that is your own separation from God, regardless of the type of hatred. By peaceful means, 
stand up, confront, denounce, renounce, and hold legal accountability, hatred and wrong, and defend, safeguard the victims of hatred and the world's contempt. To do not do otherwise is after the evil, which Dietrich Bonhoeffer sums up as one quote, Science in the face of evil is itself evil, God will not hold this. To not speak is to speak, to not act is to act. For you, as a Christian, are a peacemaker. So help the poor, help everyone in need, no matter what. Be of love, exemplify love by how you treat others. For again, love one another as I have loved you. Stay safe, everyone, and God bless. But before I go, here is a parting quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. That is the heart of this and events that have transpired. There is therefore only one way of following Jesus and worshiping God, and that is to be reconciled with our brethren. If we come to hear the word of God and receive the sacrament without first being reconciled with our neighbors, we shall come to our own damnation. Let the fellowship of Christ examine itself and see whether it's given any token of Christ to the victim of the world's continuing contempt, any token of that love of Christ which seeks to preserve, support, protect life. Otherwise, however, the surety correct our service are, however devote our prayer, however brave our testimony, they will profit us nothing. Nay, rather, they must needs testify against us that we as a church have ceased to follow our Lord, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, cost discipleship. We, as Christians, have to safeguard the lives around us, especially the lives of the victims of the world's contribution and contempt. If we are to call ourselves of Christ, and if we are to do nothing, we are apathetic to evil, and God won't hold us guiltless. He'll count us equally as guilty as a person doing harm. Us defending others and safeguarding the lives of others is now more important than ever. Please pray for the families of the victims of recent mass shootings, that they find peace and are able to get healing and love and know of love once more, that things change here in the U.S. especially, so that these types of incidents will happen far less, and do your best to legally make certain of it by helping make changes to society, by voting for common sense gun laws, and be advocating for changes to make the world better. We absolutely cannot be apathetic to the suffering of others if we call ourselves of Christ. If feeling called upon, please donate to verifiable charities and humanitarian organizations that are assisting Ukraine. Atrocities are still happening there day by day, and we cannot be apathetic to evil in that either. Anyways, everyone, stay safe, and God bless.